do that, uh, that's fine. If, if I need to take off mine to get you to do yours, I'll do that. Um, but, um, and or during the course of the year and you want to take your coat off, feel free. And I would like to welcome you. I would say to you that uh, it is a big panel and uh, you've probably been at big panels before. It takes a while. It's a, you're going to dedicate your afternoon to us. Um, but this is a gigantic issue and you are at the very beginning of telling this tale uh, that needs to be told about how the government uh, reorganizes itself to, uh, to be effective. And in some cases, it's going to demand that you, uh, you put aside the, your turf concerns in some instances for the greater good. And uh, the White House has told us that uh, in speaking to your superiors, that, that's there. Um, and uh, it is also going to require Congress as well to look at how we organize. So we know we have our responsibilities. So I welcome you and I would also say to you, because this is a, a hearing on legislation, uh, we're not swearing you in. We usually swear in all our witnesses because we're an investigative committee, but we also have legislative responsibility on reorganization. Um, and I would um, say to you that, uh, again, that it is wonderful to have you here and um, to uh, just call your names and we'll proceed in the order that uh, I call you. Uh, I'll just go down the names. We have Admiral Thomas Collins, Commandant, United States Coast Guard, Department of Transportation. For the record, my brother was in the Coast Guard, uh, one of my brothers. Mr. Bruce Bauman, Director, Office of National Pre Preparedness, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Mr. Douglas Browning, Deputy Commissioner, U.S. Customs, Department of Treasury. Mr. Robert Accord, Administrator, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, Department of Agriculture. Mr. John Tritak, is, am I saying that name correctly? Mr. John Tritak, Director, Critical Infrastructure Assurance Office, Bureau of Industry Security, Department of Commerce. Mr. Larry A. Melford, Assistant Secretary, Assistant Director, Cyber Division, Federal Bureau of Investigation and Mr. Uh, Michael B. Kraft, Deputy Commissioner, Immigration and Naturalization Service. We got everybody? Um, thank you for being here. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Lewis here and we have Mr. Putnam. Uh, do either of you uh, like to make a comment before we begin this hearing? Okay, thank you. Why don't we start with you, Admiral? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, and an honor to appear before this distinguished committee. Uh, I have a full week and a half under my belt on the job. So it's, it's glad to, I'm very glad to uh, tackle the, uh, such a meaty issue here right, right out of the chute. Uh, clearly, uh, the events of September 11th have changed the focus uh, of our nation. And today we, we suffer from constant threats of terrorism, either as a coercion type thing or retaliation type thing. And it's reality, unfortunately, that's going to be with us uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, our a collective experience over the last uh, nine months demands uh, an improved awareness of the vulnerabilities and the threats with which we must deal, an increased capability uh, to detect, deter, and respond to terrorist activity, and greater unity of effort in all the participants in the Homeland Security effort. Success here will help ensure you have focused policy, focused strategy, focused doctrine, aligned resources and capabilities to keep the American public safe and secure. And I, I think these objectives are very clearly underscored in the first two panels uh, that, prepared, that appeared before you today. Under the leadership of President Bush, we have all leaned forward <laughs> with uh, increased vigilance, stiffened our resolve, and allocated resources to the greatest risk areas. And much has been accomplished. But with this announcement last Thursday to create a single Homeland Security Department, the President has taken the next logical step to ensure an effective posture of readiness for our nation. From the Coast Guard's perspective, it's a necessary change whose time has come. The proposed organization will bring unity of effort and unity of command to homeland security efforts with clear lines 
of authority to get the job done. It will serve to enhance awareness of threats and vulnerabilities so effective preventative actions can be instituted in a timely way. It will minimize the impact of a terrorist act should a response be needed and will help ensure alignment of personnel and resources to the highest priority areas. I should offer that the Coast Guard uh, is a logical component of the proposed department. Nearly 50 percent of our current operating budget is directly related to the fundamental and core missions of the proposed department. The bulk of the remaining missions uh, contribute indirectly to the overall national security interests of the nation. We also have a unique set of competencies, capabilities, and authorities that will add considerable value to the new department. We've been a leader for the non-defense, Department of Defense Maritime Security of our and needs of our nation since 1790. It was the reason we were formed 212 years ago. We possess extensive regulatory and law enforcement authorities governing ships, boats, personnel, and associated activities in our ports, waterways, and offshore maritime regions. We are a military service with 7x24 command communication and response capabilities. We maintain at the ready a network of coastal small boat station, captain of the ports, air stations, and cutters to prevent and respond to safety and security incidents. And we have geographic presence throughout the country, its coasts, rivers, lakes, both in large ports and small ports. We are a formal member of the national foreign intelligence community. We partner with other government agencies in the private sector to multiply the effectiveness of our services. These partnerships are standard operating procedures in all that we do. And we are the recognized leader in the world regarding maritime safety, security, mobility, and environmental protection issues. I'm in full agreement with the critical elements of the President's proposal. To maximize the Coast Guard's effectiveness in the new department, I believe it is essential that the following stipulation should apply. The Coast Guard remains intact. The Coast Guard retains its essential attributes as a military, multi-mission maritime service, and that the full range, the full range of missions is actively supported. It's also important to note that the threats to the security of our homeland extend beyond overt terrorism. Countering illegal drug smuggling and other contraband in the transit zones, preventing illegal migration via maritime routes, preserving living marine resources from foreign encroachment, preventing environmental damage and responding to spills of hazardous material, Maintaining an effective maritime transportation system are all critical elements of national security and directly bear on homeland security. They are all Coast Guard responsibility. This mission set was recognized and validated as recently as 1999 by the Presidential Interagency Task Force on Coast Guard Roles and Missions. Our full range of missions, all critical to the nation, would continue to serve America in a robust way under President Bush's proposal. We have functioned extremely well uh, with the Department of Transportation for now over uh, 35 years, most recently under the support and visionary leadership of Secretary Mineta. However, today's security realities necessitate bold action to ensure the safety of the public, including governmental reorganization where and when it makes sense. The Department of Transportation and the Coast Guard strongly support the President in his proposal to create the new Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Transportation will continue to oversee the mobility and the safety of the transportation system, and I envision the Coast Guard will always be a very close partner with the Department of Transportation and the Marine Transportation System issues. In conclusion, uh, the Coast Guard remains dedicated to the safety and security of our needs of our nation, to the protection of our marine environment, to the contributions as a military service in the defense of our country. We will continue to answer the call. We will continue to live our motto, 
Uh, Semper Paratus always, always ready, as we've done for the past 212 years. Uh, it's a, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you or the subcommittee may have at the appropriate time. Thank you, Admiral. I told you that my brother was in the Coast Guard. I should have also said that he was eight years older than me, and I really looked up to him uh, and uh, his service in the Coast Guard. Delighted you were here. Thank uh, you, sir. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bauman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to represent uh, Director Albaugh, who regrets he's unable to be here today to, to testify. Let me begin by outlining uh, FEMA's role in support of Homeland Security. For more than 20 years, FEMA has been the nation's lead agency in preparing for and responding to emergencies and disasters, regardless of cause. The agency has a core competency in managing the consequences of disasters to include acts of terrorism. Under the Federal Response Plan, FEMA coordinates the emergency response activities of 28 departments and agencies. When President Bush asked Director Albaugh to establish the Office of uh, National Preparedness in May of this year, its primary mission was to prepare, provide a central point of coordination for a wide range of federal programs dealing with uh, terrorism preparedness. Although the Office of uh, National Preparedness was formally established only eight months ago, our responsibilities were greatly enhanced as a result of 911. Because of FEMA's unique capabilities and leadership role in consequence management, the President selected our agency to lead the first responder program when he announced it several months ago. The mission and overriding objective of the Office of National Preparedness at FEMA is to help this country be better prepared to respond to emergencies and disasters of all kinds, including acts of terrorism. This work is underway right now. Our effort has three major focuses. One is providing central coordination point for all federal preparedness programs. Second is the first responder initiative. And third is supporting the Office of Homeland Security. The Office of Na National Preparedness was established to meet the need for a single entity to take the lead in coordinating federal preparedness programs designed to build the capability of state and local government to respond to emergencies and disasters. In our view, it is essential that the responsibility for pulling together and coordinating federal preparedness programs be situated in a single agency. And I think former reports such as the uh, Hart Redmond Report and the Gilmore Commission has, has affirmed that. President Bush's proposal for the Department of Home Department of Homeland Security would greatly facilitate this effort. FEMA's current efforts would be folded into this department and our work would continue, including working with and coordinating the response of the 28 agencies through the Federal Response Plan, interfacing this plan, plan with state and local government, planning, training, and exercising federal, state, and local emergency responders, providing grant assistance to build emergency response capabilities at the state and local level, organizing the national response systems, such as the National Urban Search and Rescue System, which responded to the World Trade Center in Oklahoma City, the National Disaster Medical System, and a na building a national mutual aid, mutual aid capability. Responding to emergencies of all ki kinds as we have in the past uh, would continue uh, to include situations like Oklahoma City World Trade Center and the Pentagon. As I mentioned, we have been America's response to disasters, uh, and it's been our mission for the last 20 years. We see this work continuing under a new Department of Homeland Security. One of the most important lessons learned from 911 is the value of a strong, effective state and local response capability. The President requested $3.5 billion in the 03 budget to support first responders. These funds would help them plan, train, and acquire equipment needed and conduct exercises in preparation for terrorist attacks or other emergencies. Right now, we are developing a streamlined and accountable procedure that would speed the flow of monies to the first response community. Specifically, these funds would be used to develop, a comprehensive, to develop comprehensive emergency response plans, purchase equipment that is needed to respond effectively, to include communications interoperability, would provide training for the first responders uh, to prepare them for terrorist incidents and operating in contaminated environments, and develop a comprehensive, regular exercise program that would be used to improve response capabilities. 
The President is requesting funds in the O2 Spring Supplemental to support this initiative also, including $175 million for state and local governments to upgrade and, in some cases, develop comprehensive emergency operations plans. These comprehensive plans would form the foundation for the work to be done in O3 to prepare the first responders for terrorist attacks. ONP's work in other areas would continue. These include the development of a comprehensive training compendium easily accessible by state and local governments, the development of a robust national mutual aid system, the development of a national exercise program, and the development of interoperability standards for communications and first responder equipment. What I have described involves those portions of Homeland Security effort in which FEMA is most directly involved, preparedness and consequence management, and working with the other federal, state, and local emergency response uh, organizations. The President said from the outset that the overall structure for organizing and overseeing Homeland Security would evolve over time. His proposal for the Department of Homeland Security would unify the nation's efforts to protect the American people, and the functions that FEMA performs would be key to the mission of the new Department of Homeland Security. The new department would administer federal grants under the First Responder Initiative, as well as grant programs managed by the Departments of Justice, Department of Health and Human Services, and FEMA. The new Department of Homeland Security would address head-on the problem of fragmentation and duplication in federal uh, terrorism training programs. The structure of the newly proposed department recognizes that FEMA's mission and core recognizes that FEMA's uh, mission and core competencies are essential components of Homeland Security. Congress can rest assured that the nation's response to acts of terrorism and the efforts of the first responders will be transparent to state and local governments, and that the entire first responder community uh, would would be wrapped into that. Mr. Chairman, this uh, concludes my former remarks. I would be happy to uh, entertain questions. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. We will have questions, and that's helpful. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Browning. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I know that the subcommittee has a great deal of interest in discussing the pending proposals to realign certain government agencies as set forth in the President's proposal for a new Department of Homeland Security and the inclusion of the entire U.S. Customs Service in that department. Commissioner Bonner has told the employees of the U.S. Customs Service that he fully supports the President's proposal and strongly believes that the new Department of Homeland Security will play a key role in safeguarding the American people. For over 200 years, the U.S. Customs Service has defended our country's borders and facilitated international trade and travel. Since September 11th, at the direction of the President, the top priority of the Customs Service has been responding to the continuing terrorist threat at our land borders, seaports, and airports. Our highest priority is doing everything we reasonably can to keep terrorist and terrorist weapons from entering the United States. I would like very briefly to describe for you some of our most significant efforts and initiatives on that front. Since September 11th, Customs has been at a level one alert across the country at all ports of entry. Level one requires sustained, intensive anti-terrorist questioning and includes increased inspections of travelers and goods. Because there is a continued threat that international terrorists will attack again, we are still at level one alert to this day, and we will remain so for the foreseeable future. To help ensure that Customs forms a coordinated, integrated counterterrorism strategy for border security, we established a new Office of Anti-Terrorism within the agency, and the Commissioner appointed an experienced security expert and former senior military officer to head that office. The Director of the Office of Anti-Terrorism is also helping to coordinate Customs' role within our national security architecture with the Office of Homeland Security, our fellow border inspection agencies, and other government entities. This cooperation is essential to ensure that we are effectively responding to the threat of terrorism and to our mission priorities. 
Customs continues to play an important role in the fight against terrorist financing and those who aid and abet terrorist organizations through financial support for their activities. Last October, we formed Operation Green Quest, a joint investigative team led by Customs and sponsored by the IRS, Secret Service, and other Treasury bureaus, as well as the FBI and the Department of Justice. I am pleased to report that so far, Operation Green Quest has led to the seizure of approximately 4.9 million in suspected terrorist assets and 16 arrests. Customs agents are also working diligently under Project Shield America to monitor exports of strategic weapons and materials from the United States. We are seeking to prevent international terrorist groups from obtaining sensitive U.S. technology, weapons, and equipment that could be used in a future terrorist attack on our nation. To help customs officers in the field, Commissioner Bonner also established the Office of Border Security. The mission of that office is to develop more sophisticated anti-terrorist targeting techniques for passengers and cargo in the seaport, airport, and land border environments. In approaching our primary mission to prevent terrorist and terrorist weapons from transiting our borders, Customs has promoted several initiatives to push our line of defense outward. The ultimate aim of pushing our security outward is to allow U.S. Customs more time to react to potential threats, to stop threats before they reach us, and to expedite the flow of low-risk, legitimate commerce across our borders. These efforts include the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, more commonly known as CTPAT which is a partnership with U.S. importers to improve security along the entire supply chain, from the loading docks of foreign vendors to our land borders and seaports. We were very pleased to have Governor Ridge and Secretary O'Neill participate in our announcement of CTPAT at the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit in April of this year. As Governor Ridge noted, CTPAT is important because it strengthens the security of our borders while speeding up the flow of legitimate goods. Another initiative is the 30-point Smart Border Declaration signed by Homeland Security Director Governor Tom Ridge and Canadian Deputy Prime Minister John Manley. Part of that plan includes placing U.S. Customs and Canadian Customs personnel in each other's ports to help in the targeting and pre-screening of cargo that arrives in one country and is destined for the other. The Container Security Initiative, or CSI, places Customs Enforcement personnel in major foreign shipping ports. The Customs officers will establish international security criteria for identifying high-risk cargo containers that potentially pose a risk of containing terrorist or terrorist weapons. We will pre-screen the high-risk containers at their ports of shipment utilizing detection technology, and we will develop and deploy secure containers with electronic seals and sensors to indicate potential tampering. The effective use of technology depends on good targeting, for which we require advanced information. The Automated Manifest System, or AMS, is an automated application that uses information called from a vast database of shipping and trading activities. Using selectivity systems that operate within AMS, we are able to sort through cargo manifests provided to customs by shippers and carriers and pick out those that appear unusual, suspect, or maybe high risk. Legislation currently under consideration mandating the advanced electronic transmission of cargo manifest information will Excuse me, if you would uh, just kind of wrap up, you're about into seven minutes, if you just kind of wrap it up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We'll significantly increase the amount of and timeliness of information input into the customs database. We appreciate the support of the House and Senate has shown for making the advanced filing of electronic cargo manifest information mandatory. And we look forward to providing any assistance with these bills when they are uh, go to conference. All of these efforts and initiatives by customs that I have described today will bolster our defenses against terrorism 
and position us to play a significant role in this new organization. The events of September 11 demonstrate that we must be prepared for anything. The Customs Service, with its expertise and experience in protecting our nation's borders, is committed to working closely with law enforcement counterparts, as well as with members of the international community and our stakeholders in the private sector to deter terrorists who would strike America. Mr. Chairman, the Commissioner and I are proud of the vital role that the men and women of the Customs Service have played and will continue to play on the President's plan in defending the nation's homeland. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, and I'm prepared to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And uh, I think it's understood, but we'd like to say it. we're proud of the work that all your people do and all the various departments that uh, you're representing. And we're grateful of their service to our country. Mr. Accord. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> members of the subcommittee. I'm going to ask you to bring that mic a little closer. And is the green light on? Yes, it is. Maybe, maybe the other mic will reach you more easily, okay. just to ask you. Yeah, that's, why don't you work on that one? Take your time, where the clock isn't starting yet. <laughs> and it's a generous clock. Thank you. Is that better? Is that mic working? I think that's the bad mic. Oh, now it is. It's, Here we go. It's working now. Well, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service on the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security. APHIS is a multi-purpose organization with one main mission, <clears throat> protecting America's agriculture. Our main activities are designed to keep foreign pests and diseases out of the United States, to monitor and manage agriculture pests and diseases already existing in the United States, and to resolve and manage trade issues related to animal and plant health. The functions we perform are an important part of the federal government's effort to provide the nation with safe and affordable food and to defend against agricultural terrorism. As we all know, the tragic events of September 11th forever changed our country. And for APHIS, they forever change the context in which we do our work. Whereas in the past, our attentions have primarily focused on the accidental introduction of foreign pests and diseases, today we face a no longer abstract threat of intentional introduction of organisms that could disrupt American agriculture production, erode confidence in the nation's food supply, and destabilize the American economy. The President's proposal for a new Department of Homeland Security will bolster our coordination, planning, response, and management capabilities. Since the security and protection of our nation is of the highest priority, it is of utmost importance that all biological and agricultural terrorism activities be consolidated into a single department focused on homeland security. Therefore, we fully support the President's plan for the creation of this new department. It is critical that government agencies continue to work together to protect America from terrorists. In particular, we must protect our food and agriculture supply against any threat that could harm our consumers or the farm sector. While we have a strong system of protections at our borders and ports of entry that help prevent the entry of agricultural pests and diseases, it is critical in this new age of threats that we enhance the protection of America's food supply. Until this new department can be established, we in the Department of Agriculture will continue to work closely with the Office of Homeland Security, as we have since it was established in October 2001. USDA's Homeland Security Council, headed by uh, Deputy Secretary Jim Mosley, will continue to coordinate USDA's efforts to meet pressing security needs. The Council has been and will continue working with the Office of Homeland Security and will provide assistance and staff to address critical agricultural issues. APHIS has also been working intensely to coordinate with other agencies as part of our safeguarding activities, and we will continue to do so. We have always thought that one of the most fundamental bases for safeguarding border inspection system is APHIS's close cooperation with the Customs Service and other federal inspection agencies. Although a high level of cooperation existed even prior to September 11th, since that time, APHIS has, has, and these agencies have significantly strengthened their communications and direct cooperation with each other. For example, 
APHIS officials now participate with Customs in its emergency <coughs> situation facility and also in a major effort to enhance the availability of all cargo manifest information to identify cargo containers as they are used in commerce throughout the world. However, considering Homeland Security functions or consolidating Homeland Security functions into one department will ensure better communication and coordination leading to improved effectiveness. We look forward to working together with the other Homeland Security agencies as members of the same department. Again, I thank you for this opportunity to testify in the appropriate time. I'll be prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Accord. Mr. Tritek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for having me here today to uh, discuss the importance of establishing... Your mic just went off, I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's... it's just establishing a cabinet-level Homeland Security organization. In his address to the nation last week, President Bush stated he intended to create a Department of Homeland Security to ensure that he continues to carry out his most important responsibility, that of protecting and defending the people of the United States. His decision takes to take this monumental step, the most sweeping reorganization of our national security establishment in over 50 years, was made on the basis of careful study and experience since September 11. The administration considered a number of organizational approaches proposed by various commissions, think tanks, and including members of Congress, such as H.R. 460, introduced by Representatives Thornberry, Harmon, and others, as well as S. 2452, introduced by Senator Lieberman, Inspector, and others. The new Department of Homeland Security would org be organized into four divisions, border and transportation security, emergency preparedness and response, chemical, biological, and radiological nuclear countermeasures, and information analysis and infrastructure protection. The new department will be comprised mainly of existing organizational elements located in other departments and agencies. For example, my own office, the Critical Infrastructure Assurance Office, which is now located in the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security, will become part of the new Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Division. This division within the new department will place an especially high priority on protecting our critical and cyber infrastructure from terrorist attack by unifying and focusing the key activities currently performed by the Chow, the National Infrastructure Protection Center currently located at the FBI and other federal organizations. The Chow was originally created by Presidential Directive in 1998 as an interagency operation within the Department of Commerce to coordinate critical infrastructure policy. Specifically, our focus at that time was the development of national awareness and outreach programs with, private, with the private sector. We cannot achieve Homeland Security without active participation from the private sector. Homeland Security is not just good for the nation, it's actually good business. Assisting federal departments and agencies in identifying their dependencies on critical infrastructure, which is a program we refer to as Project Matrix, is another function we perform under PDD 63. And finally, developing an integrated national strategy for securing those information systems and networks essential to the operation of our nation's critical infrastructures. Under the Bush administration, Chow has taken on additional responsibilities. We serve as a member of the President's Board for Critical Infrastructure Protection. This board was created to coordinate federal efforts and programs relating to the protection of information systems and networks essential to the operation of our critical infrastructures. The administration now is proposing in his fiscal year 2003 budget request an establishment of an information integration program within the Chow to improve the coordination of information sharing essential to combating terrorism nationwide. The most important function of this office will be to design and help implement an interagency information architecture that will support efforts to find, track, and respond to terrorist threats within the United States in a way that improves both the time and response and the quality of decisions. Together with lead federal agencies and guided strategically by the Office of Homeland Security, this integration office will create an essential information inventory, determine horizontal and vertical information sharing requirements, define a target architecture for improved information sharing, and determine the personnel, software, hardware, and technical resources needed to implement the architecture. Foundation programs will produce roadmaps or mitigation strategies that will be used by the agencies to move from where they are now to a desired state. The Office of Homeland Security and the Integration Office will also define near-term pilot projects and proof-of-concept initiatives that can immediately address short-term Homeland Security requirements. 
Having the child as a formal part of the new department will strengthen the coordination we have been working to foster, and that is the core of the child's mission. For this reason, the Secretary of Commerce, the Under Secretary of Commerce for Industry and Security, and myself fully, fully support the President's plan to relocate the Chow from the Department of Commerce to the new Department of Homeland Security. Indeed, even before the new department was announced, the Under Secretary of Commerce for Industry and Security had planned to relocate Chow with the staffs of the Office of Homeland Security and the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board. The country needs a single, unified Homeland Security structure that will improve protection against today's threats and be flexible enough to help meet the unknown threats of the future. Thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Tritac. Uh, Mr. Melford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to Is testify. your mic on? It's Mefford, isn't it? There it is. Am I pronounced? It's Mefford? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr. Mefford. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this very important topic. I've recently been assigned as the assistant director of the FBI's new cyber division uh, as, part of the, uh, as part of the director's reorganization of the FBI in an effort to improve efficiency in information sharing and streamline operations. I've recently, as part of this assignment, been assigned a responsibility for overseeing the National Infrastructure Protection Center, referred to as the NIPC, which is now starting its fifth year of operation. This center provides a national threat assessment, warning, investigation, and response capability for the interagency uh, process and members of the center. NIPC's historical emphasis has been on protecting the nation against cyber attacks, although it also has a mission to protect the critical infrastructure of the United States. By way of background, as you uh, know, the creation of the NIPC grew out of the efforts of the President's Commission on Critical Infrastructure Protection, which after a year of studying a wide range of issues, provided recommendations to the President in October of 1997. In May of 98, the White House released a blueprint for coordinating the federal government's uh, role in addressing both cyber and physical attacks on the critical infrastructure of the country. The interagency NIPC was formed to prevent and mitigate such attacks and to uh, collaborate with the and to work with the private sector to enhance the ability to do so. The Center has accomplished this by forging an alliance uh, between roughly a dozen federal agencies working full-time in the Center at FBI headquarters currently, and with key management positions held by the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, and the Department of Defense, as well as through a variety of public outreach uh, programs, such as InfraGuard and the Key Asset Initiative uh, created by the uh, NIPC. The center today consists of about 145 FBI positions, 42 other agency personnel, and 53 private sector contractors for a total of about 240 personnel. The FBI's role in the NIPC includes field support represented by our investigative and technical personnel located across the country, supporting the FBI's responsibility for criminal counterterrorism and counterintelligence cyber-related investigations. It also includes the community outreach efforts uh, as I noted previously. Both the InfraGuard initiative and the Key Asset initiative, which were generated by the NIPC, uh, focus on critical infrastructure protection and the sharing of threat data across a, a broad spectrum of uh, private industry. The NIPC's current strategy concentrates on prediction, uh, prevention, detection, and mitigation of cyber threats and works very closely with the private sector on protecting key assets throughout the nation. These sectors include government operations, gas and oil storage and delivery, water supply systems, banking and finance, transportation, electrical <coughs> energy, telecommunications, and emergency services. A key to success in these areas will be strengthened cooperation uh, with the domestic and foreign intelligence collectors and the application of sophisticated new analytical tools to better learn from day-to-day -day trends and to improve our ability to predict those actual threats, especially in the cyber arena. With respect to our future direction, the FBI is committed to ensuring that the NIPC mission is effectively accomplished. We look forward to working to ensure that an efficient transfer of the NIPC mission to the proposed Department of Homeland Security occurs and to improve the FBI's ability to conduct our criminal investigative and national security responsibilities and contribute to the significant NIPC mission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mefford. Um, Mr. Beecraft. Does that reach over to you? I think so. Can you I, hear me? I hear you great. Great. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to be appear before this subcommittee today to discuss the important topic of how our government is organized to combat terrorism. The President has proposed a bold and revolutionary approach to protecting our country from internal and external forces that threaten our physical safety. I know I speak for all 35,000 men and women of the Immigration and Naturalization Service in saying that we at the INS intend to do our part to make the Department of Homeland Security and its critical mission a success. Commissioner Ziegler and I strongly support the creation of this new cabinet-level department and consider this an important and very positive development for the security of our nation and for the mission employees and employees of the INS. In this new unified structure, the Home Department of Homeland Security will have one of the most important missions of our government, protecting the American people and ensuring the safety of our institutions and our precious freedoms. The functions of the INS are particularly well situated for the transition to this new department. We have long recognized that the INS needs to be restructured, and we have taken many fundamental steps in that direction. However, there has been the lingering question as to what, what the final new structure would look like. The new Department of Homeland Security would include the functions of the INS and would, consistent with the President's longstanding position, separate immigration services from immigration law enforcement. The Department would build an immigration services organization that would administer our immigration law in an efficient, fair, and humane manner. The Department would make certain that America continues to welcome visitors and those who seek opportunity within our shores while excluding terrorists and their supporters. To understand the full meaning and the potential benefit of these proposed changes, a few statistics help to put the current INS mission and its challenges into context. More than 500 million inspections are conducted at our ports of entry every year. The INS has roughly 5,000 inspectors to process these hundreds of million visitors who arrive at our borders every year. INS has approximately 2,000 investigators throughout the country to deal with persons who have entered illegally, are criminal aliens, or have overstayed their visas or otherwise have violated the terms of their status as visitors to the United States. The agency has experienced explosive growth over the past several years, growing at an annual rate of more than 10 to 20 percent, including a doubling in the size of its workforce since 1994. In the past eight years alone, more people have applied for naturalization than in the previous 40 years combined. Wow. INS hardworking employees have done a tremendous job under difficult circumstances in response to the tragic events of September 11. Since September 11, INS special agents, intelligence analysts, detention officers, and others have worked closely with FBI-led counterterrorism task forces. They've generated and pursued thousands of leads, resulting in the arrest of more than 700 aliens for a variety of administrative and criminal charges. Border Patrol agents and immigration inspectors have been working just as diligently to strengthen security at our ports and along our borders. And we appreciate the support of the National Guard in this effort. While my written statement includes a fuller inventory of our efforts and accomplishments, I would like to take a moment to highlight some of the other important initiatives we have undertaken since September 11 to enhance security. Since September 11, and like the Customs Service, we have been thre at threat level one at our ports of entry. Shortly after the terrorist attacks, INS began Operation Tarmac, an initiative designed to ensure that employees who have access to secure areas of airports and other critical security infrastructures are legally in this country, authorized to work, and pose no threat to the American people. After September 11, INS began conducting the Absconder Apprehension Initiative, designed to ensure that aliens against whom final orders of removal have been entered do indeed leave the country. INS also has worked with the State Department to establish new initiatives to increase security. Today, INS inspectors have access to visa data from the consolidated consular database system, and as a result, can call up visa records for immigrants and non-immigrants and photos of non-immigrants as they arrive at ports of entry. The system helps to identify security and fraud risks. Under the direction of the Department of Justice, the INS and the FBI are integrating the IDENT and IAFIS fingerprint uh, databases. As part of this process, the United States Marshal Service Federal Fugitive Fingerprints and FBI Fingerprints of Foreign Nationals Wanted by Law Enforcement have been added to IDENT. This overall effort has resulted in the identification of over 1,600 individuals wanted for felony crimes that include homicide, rape, drug crimes, and weapons violations. 
We are moving forward on initiatives to strengthen our administration of non-immigrant student and visitors, including CVIS and regulatory changes to strengthen oversight of foreign students and the programs they attend, as well as visitors to this country. The INS has been working closely with the Office of Homeland Security in its planning for implementation of an entry exit system. Last week, the Attorney General announced the National Security Entry Exit Registration System. In close concert with the Office of Homeland Security, we have worked with our neighbors in Canada and Mexico and agreed upon several concrete initiatives to secure safety and security and smooth the flow of legitimate travelers and goods. Let me emphasize, while responding to the need for heightened security nationwide, INS is accountable and will remain attentive to our immigration enforcement and benefits missions. Agents, officers, and attorneys throughout the country are attending to our other mandates. Mr. Chairman, all of us at INS want to improve our system's operations and performance. We believe that the major changes envisioned by the President's proposal will enable us to achieve the results the nation deserves. INS will continue in its dual mission to adjudicate applications for immigration benefits and enforce the immigration laws of the administration and the Congress work to, as the Congress and, the Congress and administration work together on legislation to establish the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Chairman, I may be sitting on the edge of this table at the very end, but I assure you that INS is in the heart of this battle, and uh, we continue uh, to fight. How long did it take you to think of that? Uh, I just thought it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say to you, I appreciate you all being here. We're all cowards. We didn't take off our coats. I guess it's we want to have the, the look of authority as we speak here. It was Admiral Collins, sir. Yeah. <laughs> we knew he couldn't take off his coats, so the rest of us uh, would Exactly. Yeah. It's all your fault, Jim. Admiral. Um, let me say that it's my decision that we're going to take 10 minutes uh, per questioner because um, it, it, it would be it's kind of silly, uh, in my judgment, to do the five, and then one or two of you could respond. I want you to feel free to jump in, even if the question is addressed to someone else, if you think you have a contribution to make on that particular question. And we might, if, if, if the questioner is a little uncomfortable that he's not able or she to get to the questions, we uh, might extend over. But Mr. Putnam, you have 10 minutes, and uh, we'll go down and we'll do a second round as well. Uh, Mr. Sada, that means that it's going to take us a little longer to get to you, but um, I think we get better information if we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our distinguished panel. You of all, your agencies have been under a lot of pressure since September the 11th, but with the President's speech last week, your world turned upside down. And I appreciate you coming up here to dutifully and if only half-heartedly profess your love for this new reorganization plan. But I think that you owe it to this panel to be very candid in your remarks about how we get there from here. I appreciate the professionalism that all of you have to make the President's plan work. And it's that kind of an attitude that's going to make this a successful plan. But the iron triangles have been ringing all over town through back channels expressing concerns about different pieces of this plan and how they impact all of the different agencies. And so I think that you owe it to us to give us a clear-eyed policymaker's viewpoint because you're in the trenches and you deal with this every day. And we can't afford to turn the federal government upside down through rose-colored, daisy-sniffing marches toward groupthink. And so as we move through this, if we're not asking the right questions, I hope you'll let us know, and I hope that you will be completely candid in your assessment of how this will impact your specific mission and how you serve the American people. If the gentleman would yield, you can do it in a way by saying the challenges that present themselves, <laughs> and we'll know what you mean. The, uh, the Admiral very candidly laid out some, some stipulations that this will be successful if and I think that that sets a, uh, a model for all of us to follow on how to make this situation work. And I will begin by asking of, uh, of the gentleman from FEMA. In panel one, we heard from Congressman Gibbons that it, it was his intention or his viewpoint that the primary function of the Department of Homeland Security would be to focus on foreign terrorist threats to the homeland. Do you believe that in that context, that your current responsibilities in, with flood, with hurricanes, with tornadoes, and with incidents 
that may turn out not to be foreign related as we are, have yet to find out with anthrax and as we found out in Oklahoma City, will those issues be adequately resolved under the structure as it exists today? I'm not sure I'm following the question, but uh, you know, if you're asking uh, if it's a foreign threat, what would it? What would we do differently uh, domestically? Is is that the gist of your question? But the question is: Do you believe that that the administration's intent is for the department to only deal with foreign threats? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, that would be different than what we heard from panel one. Yeah, I I think it is to deal with. Uh, the domestic, certainly for FEMA, we're now dealing with domestic uh, consequences to terrorism, regardless of whether it's caused by a foreign uh, uh, terrorist group. Uh, it does damage domestically, like the World Trade Center or the Pentagon, and uh, we would respond to that. I, w I would agree with you, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, c for the Customs Service, you, as you understand it, would you only lose the law enforcement component, or would your entire agency be transferred? Um, as I understand it, the President's proposal has the entire agency with all of our m core missions going over to the organization. And indeed, I think early in this process, when we started the dialogue with the administration on how to approach this issue, uh, Commissioner Bonner made it absolutely clear that from the U.S. Customs Service standpoint, it was critically important that all of our mission requirements go over. We, we have four core missions. Clearly, border security today is our top priority. But we are a law enforcement agency, and we have been a law enforcement agency and quite good at that business for quite some period of time. At the same time, we've been able to weave into that law enforcement and border security mission uh, the, the trade facilitation and trade compliance piece. Um, there was a point in time when there was a very adversarial relationship between the U.S. Customs Service and our stakeholders, the trade community, and that has changed. Uh, and in fact, 9-11 has provided us with even more opportunities to weave together those four missions. And in many respects, the efficiencies that we've been able to achieve as an organization is due to the fact that we have been able to balance our law enforcement, border security, trade compliance, and trade facilitation missions together and to get some synergy from those missions. You, you so, currently inspect 1 to 2 percent of cargo shipments, is that correct? Uh, uh, Congressman, I actually think that, that, that 1 to 2 percent is, is a number that people have latched on that doesn't fairly reflect what actually happens here. Um, we look at 100 percent of everything that comes into this country. Okay, we take a look at the documentation that comes on. We use very sophisticated rules-based analysis to determine what is at risk and what we ought to take a look at. The 2 percent number that you have heard bantied about in the media reflects what is is believed to be uh, stripped down and actually opened um, at the seaports. If you take the aggregate numbers of everything we look at across the board, it is upwards of 6 percent. And if you go to some of our ports that are adequately equipped with non-intrusive uh, inspection equipment, such as gamma ray, vacuus, and x-ray equipment, it could be upwards 15 to 18 percent. So. I don't want the American public to think that we are letting things just slip through. Everything gets looked at, and those things that we break down are those things that we have serious concern about. Okay, and let's, let's assume the best case scenario, y'all are yes, inspecting 15 to 18 percent. What will that number be after you are transferred to the Department of Homeland Security? Uh, we would hope, and actually I think, like many of the agencies here, we're a multi-mission organization. We would hope that through um, economies of scale, both with respect to, to information systems, with respect to the ability to share information with the additional resources that there would be a force multiplier that would make our job better and allow us to do a better job. Uh, one of the things that we know we've got to do, given the volume of stuff that comes in this country, is we have got to, to take full advantage of technology to help us do this job. And the good news for us is that a number of you on the panel uh, have been very, very supportive of the U.S. Customs Service over the years. And as a result of that, uh, we look in good shape to get some of the equipment and tools we need to do our job better. I would not expect there to be a change. In fact, I would expect us to be able to do the job better. Mr. Acord, currently one of APHIS's missions, in addition to interdiction and, and prevention of plant pests and diseases entering our nation 
is phytosanitary dispute resolution, and you also have the legal authority to quarantine. Will those components also transfer to the Department of Homeland Security? Congressman Putnam, it's, it's my understanding that the, all of the agency and its activities will transfer to the Homeland Security uh, uh, Department. Do, do you believe that the non-terror related threats to the agricultural industry and threats to food safety that are not maliciously created, that are not maliciously introduced. They may be accidental introductions through tourists, through uh, tag-alongs in cargo containers, some kind of a pest that gets sealed up. Will those be a priority and will the eradication of those pests, once they are established in the country, be a receive the adequate attention under the Department of Homeland Security, and where will the crossover be between Homeland Security and USDA? Congressman, I think there's no reason to, to believe whatsoever that the Department of Homeland Security would not focus you know, on the ongoing programs that we have. The emergency response or the, the response to an infestation, whether it's you know, accidentally introduced or deliberately introduced, the response is much the same from, from our perspective. So there's no reason to believe that, that this wouldn't receive a priority, that we wouldn't continue to address uh, uh, you know, these issues the same way that we uh, have in, in the past. So the Department of Homeland Security, for example, would then assume responsibility for the eradication of citrus canker in Florida or the eradication of carnal bunt disease in, in wheat fields. That would be a new mission of the Department of Homeland Security and not the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Well, Congressman, if you transfer the entire agency, then we transfer that mission along with it. And given you know this administration's support for animal and plant health uh, uh, issues and for you know the, the strong support that we've had, I, I don't believe that we're going to uh, be in a situation of transferring just part of the mission and letting the other uh, uh, go. I think we'll see uh, rigorous enforcement of uh, you know, our, our quarantines and continue on the, uh, with the eradication programs that we now have in place. Well, then, recognizing that threats to economic security and, and, and homeland security also can be in the form of, of food safety, and not just animal plant health or animal and plant pest disease. Uh, is it appropriate then that the Department of Homeland Security does not address the Food Safety Inspection Service or the food inspection components of FDA? Is that a gap uh, in, in, the, in the biohazard arena? Well, I, I believe that as we get into the, to the implementation, the details of the implementation of uh, you know, the President's proposal, that we will see those issues uh, addressed, sir. I look forward to working with you on that. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I hope the gentleman stays for another round. I appreciate the, the round of questions. Uh, I mean, the, the, the evolution of that question. The bottom line is, from the responses we've heard, homeland security means protecting the homeland against both the terrorist-induced attack and the natural cause attack, uh, and will be treated with the same vigor. It's still an attack. It's still, uh, the goal is still to protect, quote, unquote, the homeland. Uh, the gentleman raised other interesting points, though, about agriculture and what, what, what uh, excuse me, FDA, um, FDA, what their response should be. Uh, you heard from the vice chairman of the committee, and uh, now we turn to the chairman of the Subcommittee on Civil Service and Agency Organization, who is directly involved in the whole reorganization issue of government. Uh, Dr. Weldon, you have 10 minutes. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I don't believe I'll use the full 10 minutes. Uh, first of all, let me uh, apologize. I have some conflicting commitments uh, this afternoon. I did uh, catch some of your testimony, and, and for those I missed, I will be reviewing them. Um, and let me uh, just just ask all of you, uh, the administration, with their recommendation, they did a fairly good job of keeping it under wraps and uh, not releasing it to the public until it was fully developed, uh, and there's been some press coverage of that. Uh, were you all providing 
the administration input as they went through that process in terms of uh, what you see your needs are to meet our Homeland Security requirements in, in, over the recent weeks or months? Let me, let me take an initial stab at that. Uh, clearly, uh, and mo most of us at the table, I think, were uh, involved uh, since uh, uh, back in November, December time frame as the Office of Homeland Security's uh, policy coordinating uh, apparatus was put into place with uh, the policy coordinating committees, the deputy committees uh, meetings and principals meetings, a series of policy uh, policy coordinating, uh, coordinating bodies that considered a whole all, many many facets of the of the of the homeland security issue. Uh, the four were put on the plate right away. Uh, I, uh, IT's things first respond to bioterrorism and border security, and all those issues uh, were discussed at great length in a, in a series of meetings. And each agency had the opportunity to provide insight input uh, on these issues as they unfolded, including organizational considerations. Uh, so in a, general, in a general sense, we were part of a dialogue that took place over a number of months uh, b back and forth at various levels within each, which each of our organization, sort of at the assistant secretary level, then at the deputy level, and then at the principal's level, and that unfolded over, uh, over a number of months. Did any of you want to add to that at all? I would just... Uh I would just echo what Admiral Collins said, uh, because the Tom and I were at the table most of the time. Um, there was quite a, a clear airing of positions on all the issues, and I think on the organizational issues as well. Everyone had their opportunity uh, to uh, contribute, to put their uh, opinions in, and uh, I think that everyone walked away understanding uh, what the issues were, were on the table. Uh, I don't think uh, that this came as a great surprise to anyone. Uh, Admiral Collins, I just uh, had a specific question about <laughs> the increased demands being placed on the Coast Guard in protecting our seaports. They've been recognized. I realize all the areas represented by all the departments here are of tremendous importance and, and critical infrastructure for our nation. Uh, but in particular, I have a port in my district, and I've been able to see firsthand uh, the demands. Now, I understand the Coast Guard has gotten some funding in the supplemental and received some additional funding previously. Um, do you feel now that we're adequately funding the Coast Guard to meet the challenges that are being placed upon you? Uh, clearly, there is a as we we're, the reason we're here is an organizational uh, uh, dynamic, uh, an aspect of getting better homeland security, and we're talking through that. And there's also a resource capacity part of homeland security, a set of competencies, a set of capabilities to get the job job done right. Uh, you know, we have 361 ports and 95,000 miles of coastline, uh, and uh, that that's uh, there, and they're very valuable assets. Our ports, 95% uh, of the volume of the trade coming through uh, into our country and absolutely essentially our economy comes through our port systems, uh, comes through our waterways. Uh, and they, they are valuable and they are vulnerable. Uh, th that's a pretty potent combination. Uh, I, I think that's been recognized. I, I think Senator Rudman nailed it this morning in the panel when he, he talked about port security. Uh, and I think it's been recognized solidly by Secretary Mineta. I think it's been recognized solidly by uh, Office of Homeland Security and the President in the support of our both uh, the spring and the fall supplementals uh, in 02 and our 03 budget. Our 03 budget for the Coast Guard is the largest budget, history, uh, budget increase for the Coast Guard in its history. Uh, There's tw over 20 percent increase in our operating expense appropriation alone. That, that's the appropriation that that uh, allows us to operate sail ships, fly planes, and do all these other things. Uh, we have a, on a, a, a 30, roughly 36,000 person active duty organization, and we have civilians on top of that, but there's a, there's a 2,200 person increase uh, uh, through those supplementals and in 02. Uh, to start building out the necessary competencies, capabilities uh, to get where we need to be for the, for the nation. 
Uh, and, I, and I see that probably the multi-year effort that will continue uh, to discuss with the administration what the next steps are, uh, but see it as sort of the first phase of, of a build-out that provides us the, the necessary competencies. Our effort is to build greater awareness of threats and vulnerabilities, enhance our presence for response and deterrence, uh, protect uh, uh, critical infrastructure and provide for force protection, uh, and, and outreach uh, with partners uh, to, to, uh, to uh, leverage all our capabilities. Those are our goals. Those are our, that's what uh, our budget supports, and I think we're on the, with the right direction with the, with the great support of the, current, uh, of the pr uh, President Bush uh, and uh, Office of Homeland Security and Secretary of Transportation. Um, the other agencies, would you say that your uh, budget is adequate for the challenges that are being presented to you? And I assume you're working on the 04 budgets now, and you're putting in your requests to be able to meet these challenges under the new environment we're talking about? Congressman Newman, I think from, our, from the Customs Service standpoint, certainly um, a number of the supplementals have greatly assisted us in providing us with the additional funding that we need. One of the things that we've undertaken over the last um, several years is to develop a new um, automated system or infrastructure for our new automated commercial system, which will have also significant benefits to us in the context of homeland security. Um, one, of, one of the reasons I'm bringing up this question is, as I've talked to some of the rank and file people, I hear a lot of stories about six-day work weeks and 10-hour work days and 12-hour work days. And, you know, in the immediate post-9-11 environment, you can sustain that because the whole country is energized. But this is obviously going to be a long, protracted process, and we need to make sure that we're not overstressing our, our workforce. Um, and I, I just want some assurance that the administration is taking the appropriate action to put the people in place so that we can meet the demand. And what I hear is, yes, that's, that's going on. Yes. I would respond from the agriculture uh, perspective that... Uh, Can you just a little louder, please? Is it on? I think yeah. so. J yeah, just nice and loud. The, uh, we have in our budget request for uh, you know, fiscal year 03 an uh, increased request of $120 million to address these kinds of, uh, uh, of issues. Our port of entry programs are user fee uh, uh, based. We have... Uh, uh, you know, had supplemental money allocated to us uh, last year out of the defense supplemental to address the shortfall that occurred in the user fee collections and the uh, uh, traffic decline after 9-11. Uh, uh, we have just distributed, uh, uh, you know, last week $43 million to uh, states to assist them with the uh, emergency preparedness uh, with uh, uh, surveillance capability for surveillance for, uh, you know, foreign animal and plant diseases. So I. I think we've, uh, you know, the administration has stepped up quite, uh, quite admirably in providing those resources. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman just wanted to prove that he wouldn't use his full ten minutes. Use nine of them. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, um, Mr. Schrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me first say thank you for for being here and uh, to the folks in your agencies for the monumental task that they're going to be undertaking here. This is not going to be easy, but uh, if we're going to survive in this world, we've got, to, we've got to do this. We've got to make it work pretty quick. And let me say that I agree with Mr. Putnam that uh, we want brutally honest assessments. The day of political correctness has got to go, because if we don't, nothing is going to get accomplished here. I want to address uh, one thing that Mr. Browning said, then I'd like comments from the rest of you. I have a vested interest in, in port security. I represent the Port of Hampton Roads. Uh, which is, has the largest contingent of uh, naval vessels in the world, Navy vessels in the world, and of course a, a huge commercial port. And what I worry about is a, uh, a ship. Everybody talks about checking containers when they get into this country. I'm, I believe it's too late at that point, and I'm told 16,000 containers come into this country every day. And if we don't do something at the port of origin, we're going to be in trouble. And you, you kind of touched on that kind of like to know what your thoughts are on how we, how we solve that problem. Because I pressed, you know, I, as I came here today, I crossed under the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. I think of it every time I cross that, you know, the Chesapeake. And of course, I see the Coast Guard folks out there as well. I'm just trying to figure out how, how are we going to solve this? That is a real huge concern to me because if a, port, if a ship coming in here from a foreign port has some little device on it in one of those containers and the GPS system is set up so that when it gets behind the carrier piers, 
It blows up, the ships goes, it goes down, and then uh, our ships are locked in. And it's a huge concern of mine, and I'm just curious what your, what your thoughts are, and any other people on the panel, especially the, uh, the Commandant. Well, uh, Congressman, let me first of all respond. We greatly appreciate your comments. Actually, this has been an area of great concern for Commissioner Bonner, as you are aware. Um, and on, on, his, on his own initiative, Commissioner Bonner basically um, pressed the organization to stand up the Container Security Initiative. Uh, which it in fact does intend to move our borders away from what would be the traditional points so that we can do some of the risk assessment, some of the examinations that we need to do before that box is on a ship on its way to the United States and certainly before it's in one of our harbors. Um, and that is starting to yield some very positive results. Uh, you may have noticed that it's been very widely reported that Singapore, which is one of the largest container security ports, has in fact agreed to have us station our officers there and be part of the CSI program. We are very close to having a similar arrangement with Rotterdam. Uh, and there are at least a half dozen other major, what we refer to as mega ports, that are, we are working out the details on so that we can again extend our borders beyond the U.S. Uh, we firmly believe that that's the way to do it. And in, and in many respects, as part of the global response to counterterrorism, we believe that the, the requirements of reciprocity say we ought to be prepared to work with our counterparts in the same sense. And so we are moving forward. Are they going to do that with scanners? or uh, I'm just trying to figure out a process that would be used. Yeah. <coughs> part, of, part of it is using the rules-based targeting systems and selectivity that we have. But the other part of it also is to, to acquire the necessary non-intrusive examination equipment, which we are fortunate to have. Many of the megaports are already have the infrastructure to do that. Great. And then to ensure that we properly seal those containers. So once they leave that port, we know that if they've been tampered with, uh, we can identify those containers that may have been tampered with and take appropriate action in coordination with the other law enforcement agencies. Commandant. And hey, coming up, before you start, let me tell you that uh, uh, I don't believe you are funded adequately. I may have worn the uniform of the Navy for 24 years, but I understand the Coast Guard has probably been one of the most underfunded organizations in the military for a long time. And your predecessor had the courage to come up here a couple of years ago before I got here and say, enough is enough. We can't do it unless you pay us and, and, and provide the funding. So uh, the, the, the money you got this year was a start, but I think based on the mission you have and you're going to continue to have, uh, we're going to have to look at that very seriously to make sure you're properly funded. Yes, sir. I, I, we view it as a, as a multi-year plan, a multi-year build-out. You know, we're at the first installation, and there'll be further discussions within the administration, the magnitude of the next step. But clearly, there's an organizational dynamic playing here, and there's a resource capacity dynamic playing here, and you have to address both. Right. In terms of in terms of the the port port security issue and container, uh, I just e e echo uh, the the. The comments of my customs colleague is that uh, this this has been a multi-agency approach approach to this. There's a container working group that's been formed under the auspices of the Office of Homeland Security to examine uh, various technologies, information systems, and processes by which to solve this issue. Clearly, pushing the borders out and getting to point of origin where the container is loaded is a, is a, is, is a really attractive return on investment approach because really it's a supply, this is a transportation logistics issue as much as anything else. And it's managing the supply chain and having total visibility of the supply chain. Uh, I think heretofore, most nations of the world looked at trade from a import control perspective. And, and I think we need to get into an export control, export control perspective, uh, all of us, uh, so that we know what we're sending to our uh, fellow nations. It's a global issue. It's going to take a global solution. Uh, and that's one of the why uh, Admiral Jim Loy, my predecessor, very uh, last fall uh, you know, uh, addressed the uh, IMO, the General Assembly of the uh, IMO, uh, to introduce uh, container security issues, uh, uh, seaman credentialing, uh, facility uh, security plans. Uh, and a host of other security issues uh, so that we could get safety on the international agenda. IMO represents the shipping industry, uh, industries and groups of the world. Uh, that's where you get international uh, regimes and protocols in place. Uh, we have been very, very successful getting unanimous decision out of the General Assembly to push forward aggressively 
on some of these international initiatives. There was a, inter, a February interse, intercessional working group. There was another one in May. There's going to be another one in September. And we think we're going to see some fruits of our labors real soon on some of these issues in December. That's a, that's a tremendous accompl accomplishment because sometime that organization moves at glacial speed. Could but you please we're, suspend we're, we're, we're I, just to, I just want to make sure that the cameramen aren't interfering with the reporter. And if uh, the reporter is having a little bit of trouble, uh, just to be, give a little space to the, to the recorder. Thank you. I'd interrupt. Let, let me tell you how important I think this is. On October the uh, 11, 2000, the day before the coal incident, a major network film crew came into the port of Hampton Roads to see how close they could get to a Navy ship. They actually came right to the hull of the USS Truman, our newest carrier. The correspondent put his hand on the hull and said, my hand is on the hull of this big ship and not one person has challenged me. Next day, the coal blew up, and it got everybody's attention. It really worries me wow. the fact that it happened again with divers coming in. And I, if there's anything I can do to help either customs or Coast Guard with this, I want to be a player in this. I want to get involved because it is vitally important to our national security from the Navy standpoint and our economy from the, the, the standpoint of you know Hampton Roads, that, what comes in and out of Hampton Roads. And I'd like to help in any way I could on that. So I, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll have a second round here, Mr. Souter. I would like to say something uh, for the record that uh, 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 something that Mr. Schrock just said, uh, Congressman Schrock, has happened in a couple other borders, and I think it's been irresponsible of our media. And that is sometimes they've played games that's tried to make our agencies look bad when, in fact, we see them, we know they're there, we just chose not to shoot them or intercept them, <laughs> and that uh, it should not always be perceived by the media when they do these stunts, and they've done it in the Washington border, the Vermont border, uh, some of the other places that our agencies didn't fully well know they were there. Now, occasionally, if you want to play it, you can break through. We're trying to get our perimeter better. But we need to understand that a lack of action does not necessarily mean a lack of knowledge. And, and that you all have been criticized, and, and this has been happening at multiple borders, and almost any reporter in America can do this type of thing if they're looking for that kind of story. But uh, to, to show that you actually caught them might tip off some of the technology we have. And there needs to be an understanding by the American people that we're not interested in showing everything we have in, in every situation. I wanted to get one thing on the, the record as, as chairman of the anti-narcotics uh, subcommittee, and that is that the president has made it clear that there is a direct link between the funding of, of uh, terrorism and narcotics. Admiral Collins said it in his statement that uh, he viewed the uh, homeland security as narcotics uh, uh, interception as well, because if we don't get to their money sources, this would also be true of illegal uh, 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 trafficking in minors and other things that terrorists are funded by. Uh, I know Admiral Collins agrees with that. I assume also that Customs, FBI, INS agree that that would be part of the Homeland Security perimeter as at the point of the border crossing, that the funding of the terrorists is also an issue. I see each person nodding in the affirmative. FBI agree with that as, as well. Um, a, a second uh, a point that I think is, is important, because all of you have been uh, tremendous in trying to work out, particularly on the Canadian border, uh, but also the southern border. And I have been concerned over the last uh, few days in, in, in watching this. Uh, after our U.S.-Canada parliamentary session, uh, a number of the Canadians pointed out to us that they believe that even in our uh, inner uh, border groups, that the Americans have been acting a lot more unilaterally since September 11th. We have been under attack. We're behaving differently than we have in the past, even to the point of wearing flag pins uh, and, and our tone. And the, the point of this agency is not to uh, put up a wall around America. Every one of you have, I bet, I met uh, border teams and so on. And in actuality, this should, to the degree we have harmonization of laws and cooperation from Canada and Mexico, should make it easier for their countries to work with the United States. Is it not correct? In other words, do you agree that the goal here is to make it better and that we're going to need better clearances in Vancouver and Singapore. The goal is to make this easier. The goal isn't to erect a wall and that this new department should not be perceived by our allies around the world and our neighbors who, uh, who are so critical and independent of economic security that somehow we are unilaterally doing something that's going to make it necessarily tougher 
uh, to move commerce, to move visitors, to move tourism, to move uh, uh, nurses across at Detroit, for example? Um, Congressman Sauter, let me first of all say I couldn't, you couldn't have said it better. I think, in fact, uh, well, first of all, let me, on behalf of the U.S. Customs Service, uh, continue to say thank you because you've always been a big supporter of this agency and we appreciate that. Um, I have, in, in my 26 years of government service, um, um, all of which have been with the U.S. Customs Service, very proudly to state, uh, never seen the level of engagement of a commissioner in the issues that we're talking about right now. And I'm talking about Commissioner Bonner being personally engaged in meeting with his Canadian and Mexican counterparts to work out the arrangements that we've been able to achieve government. And when you talk about the Smart Border Accord, um, well, what's happened is real meaning to that accord has been given by the fact that Commissioner Bonner and Commissioner Wright from Canada have sat down face to face on numerous occasions and themselves hammered out the details of that arrangement. Uh, the same thing is true with our Mexican colleagues. Um, I think we all know that this is, as you say, not about Fortress America, but it is about us taking all the measures we can to work bilaterally and multilaterally to ensure that we secure the international supply chain. And that also includes programs like CTPAT, where we draw the trade into that process. So to the extent that people are a little concerned that we are acting unilaterally, maybe what's happening is we're acting swiftly. And that speed would, and resolve with which we are trying to achieve some of these things may suggest that we're trying to be unilateral. But I can say from my experience, having seen the commissioner, having, having seen the uh, contacts we've had with our counterparts, that we're doing anything but trying to be bilateral. We know we can't win this war alone. It has to be a multilateral war. And it has to be done across a broad spectrum of players and stakeholders. And, and the, I, I would just the, add, from from the agriculture perspective, that uh, you know, we too have been working with our counterparts in uh, both Canada and Mexico, uh, under Secretary uh, Hawks, uh, who you know, handles marketing and regulatory programs for USDA. Met recently with uh, his colleague in uh, in Canada. We've had uh, similar meetings with officials from uh, Mexico. We have our technical people working, uh, you know, bilaterally to try to, to harmonize the, uh, you know, the regulations that uh, that we both operate under, and, and to try to make this a North American uh, uh, effort. I too would echo the the you know the comments earlier about pushing the borders out. Uh, you know, the the U.S. border for the most part ought to be considered a second line of defense, not a first line. I think we need to be looking more overseas at what's going into the containers. We need to push more of this activity offshore. I have seen tremendous cooperation over the last few months in working with the various uh, uh, other agencies in enforcing this kind of attitude and this kind of initiative to, uh, uh, to look beyond the, uh, you know, the border for the solution here. I'd actually like to pick up on <clears throat> the points that we made a little earlier and emphasize, I think, is a key theme that the Congressman is raising. Homeland Security cannot be sort of a euphemism for neo-isolationism. Uh, the whole purpose of many of these terrorist uh, activities is to actually force us to withdraw from our global commitments. If the United States backed out of the Persian Gulf and the Middle East, we probably would not be having the problems we're having right now. And of course, they're not going to achieve that goal. But if you listen to what al-Qaeda has been saying, it's attack the pillars of the economy and force us to turn inward and to basically withdraw our engagements and our responsibilities. So quite honestly, the whole purpose of the Homeland Security strategy and all the efforts every agency you see at this table is for is to preserve the American way of life so that we can continue our global involvement, continue to, to bring the fruits of free, free enterprise and democracy abroad to those who otherwise would try to prevent us from doing that and actually force us to retrench uh, our activities. So I completely concur with your concerns and that the fact that we're, pr we're protecting the, uh, the United States of people and property within the borders of the United States is not to be, to be viewed as saying that's all we're concerned about. It's a means to an end. Not to mention the fact with a 5,200-mile border with Canada, it yes. would be downright silly to think that we can uh, seal that whole border. I was just up at uh, Sweetgrass in Montana and have been up at Portal in, in North Dakota between the uh, Rocky Mountains and the uh, Lake of the Woods in Minnesota. There is nothing but wide open spaces. And uh, it, there's only a certain amount we're going to be able to do without a, a lot more uh, clearances. Uh, may I ask one other uh, question? That um, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, I heard 
some, and, and I'll, I'll pursue this a little further in the uh, second round, but it's been suggested that we might actually uh, save money with this agency um, and uh, reduce resources. Uh, there isn't a cheap way to do this, and I, I wanted to pick up on a comment that Admiral Collins uh, said and ask you a question, and I'm going to pursue it a little bit more. Um, you just find, for example, fisheries inside the Homeland Security question. Obviously, if we don't intercept the people who are trying to put these mile, two-mile-long nets in the middle of the salmon run, we won't have a fisheries industry in the whole West Coast because they'll get them and there won't be any back to spawn. And if the Coast Guard is pulled back to the tight border, and, and you're not out in Alaska, and you're not having your boats down off Mexico watching for illegal narcotics, and everybody's pulled in along the border, uh, we'll, we'll lose those things. And what I'm trying to figure out, and many other members, when we get down to the actual nitty-gritty of this, if you have a boat on the Detroit River, and you have an obscure tip that somebody may be hitting chemical plants somewhere along a river, which could be about anywhere, and you're watching along Sarnia, and a, a sailboat tips over uh, out further up in Lake Huron, how do you perceive this is going to evolve as to how the actual boat commander, who may be the only one given your limited resources, and he's got to choose where to go? Because previously, this search and rescue would have been the number one priority because Homeland Security was not in your primary mission. Uh, yeah, th that uh, cl clearly, uh, search and rescue and the saving of life uh, takes priority in all instance. So, you know, th that decision th that decision in that particular instance would be fairly quick one, an instantaneous one, that we will defer to the search and rescue case when life is at stake uh, and prosecute the highest threat, the highest risk uh, issue. In fact, all our allocation of uh, all our resources against all our mission portfolio is basically a risk-based algorithm where we're putting resources to the highest risk. Uh, do, we, do we have uh, uh, have we pulled back on some of our other missions to do uh, our, our uh, Homeland Security mission? Yes. Did we do it in the immediate post 9-11 period? Yes. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, a great percentage <laughs> pulled back in the immediate aftermath and we're throttling back on that and reallocating our resources back into uh, our, our other missions and see steady state uh, uh, just a couple of percentage points below in terms of fisheries enforcement and counter drugs where we were pre-9-11. That's because the size of the size of the pie, thankfully, with the 03 budget is getting a little bigger. Uh, and, and so that uh, we have, we've gotten some, some additional resources to, to cover those things. Still, uh, still a capacity issue for us, clearly. Uh, and, and as we uh, build out uh, our competencies and capabilities, uh, over the next two or three years, we're going to have to continue to pursue a risk-based approach to the allocation of our resources. Uh, and that, that's our full intent. We're doing, uh, just one other note, uh, we're doing port vulnerability assessments. Uh, that they're funded within the supplemental and a part of our 03 budget. They're part of the Maritime Security Bill now into consideration, but passed by both House, but now it's House and Senate now in consideration, uh, ultimately in conference. Uh, but they call for port vulnerability assessments for, all, for our major ports. They get a handle on the threats and the vulnerabilities, which will further help us make that threat, uh, that allocation of resources against the highest threat. Thank you. I uh, thank the gentleman for his question. Uh, Mr. Tyler, I just wonder if you could just involve me in a bit of a dialogue. There is no question that costs go up to fight this war on terrorism. That needs to be separated from the issue of when we reorganize our government, are we adding costs, or are there synergies that could help reduce costs? In practical effect, I would suggest that the con com com combining and the consolidation will mean that we use resources better, but there probably won't be a savings because we'll try to do more. But in addition, just fighting the war on terrorism, irrespective of, of, of a reorganization, will take more of our resources. And then your concern, obviously, is with those non-so-called terrorist activities, will they suffer? And I think we, as a Congress, have to make sure that they don't suffer. Well, the Chairman, yeah. you for a brief dialogue sure. on that? I think one of the biggest dilemmas we look at in our committee is to make sure that, in fact, if we're changing the missions of the agencies in the name of cost saving, that we do that publicly and state in that debate. Because it very easily could be that we shift the mission to counterterrorism and then 
reduce another mission uh, in the name because we don't want to increase the spending and de facto do that uh, in a different way. Plus, we have not yet heard, uh, and I would be interested and hope we'll draw out in the second panel, where the cost savings through the synergy is because uh, having worked with this for a long time uh, doesn't mean I, I believe we'll get efficiency of being able to target uh, for protection. I believe we'll have better information sharing, but I'm not sure what the cost saving is even in that process unless we're talking about laying off large groups of people, uh, unless we're doing certain things. We really haven't put on the table anywhere what that cost saving is. Yeah. I, I suspect there isn't a cost savings, but there is better use of the resources we have. And if we then try to say there's cost savings and make it happen, I do agree with you. I think what you're suggesting is that there will be programs that, that would, in fact, suffer that may be non-terrorist related. Are we kind of in the same wavelength here? Yeah. Um, Mr. Platts, you have the floor, and then I'll take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly thank all of our panelists for being here today and, and certainly for your uh, service to our nation's citizens uh, day in and day out. Uh, you certainly have a tremendous task uh, ahead of you as you work to uh, well protect our citizens. I, I do want to echo Congressman Putnam's, Putnam's comments um, about the importance of, of the frankness and, and being very forthcoming, not just to Congress, but to your superiors. And I think President Bush stated it well in his address to the nation when he went specifically to, I think, FBI agents about coming forth with what they find to their superiors uh, to you as well, either to the president and vice president or to your commissioners if you're a deputy is how important of, in this area of, of probably of all areas that we have that very frank and, and open dialogue. My first specific question um, is to a director, is it Tri TriTac? Uh, yes. Or, um, regarding our nuclear power plant security and the infrastructure protection. Uh, with the Envision restructuring, um, I was wondering what, if any, uh, changes uh, you envision with the NRC's responsibility for nuclear power plant infrastructure, you know, the security of the facilities themselves? Congressman, I actually want to be very frank about this. This is not really an area that I can comment on in any particular detail. You've seen what the President has proposed in terms of moving around certain assets within the federal government, but Excuse I don't me, is, is your mic on? <clears throat> Start over again if it wasn't. Thank you. Congressman, what I was basically saying, uh, Mr. Chairman, is this is not an area that I can actually comment on in any particular detail. Um, it's not an area that I, I focus on uh, in, in my work at the Chow. Um, but we do know that this President has proposed a number of, of, made a, a number of organizational proposals to deal with some of that, and I would suggest uh, quite respectfully that you might want to talk to them directly on that. In the, um, in the proposal put out by the administration, the infrastructure, including our our energy sources, right. our utility operations, chemical plants have, sure. are included in the infrastructure. So, uh, but, tr true enough. But you're getting into a level that I, I'm not particularly comfortable dealing with. Let me just say a little bit about the way in which we operate. So maybe that could clarify any questions in your own mind. One part of the critical infrastructure protection effort is trying to engage the owners and operators of those infrastructure. Lo many of them are privately owned and operated. Mm -hmm to undertake measures to help secure themselves both from the physical, but in particular where I've been focusing on the cyber dimensions of security. Increasingly, your electric power industry, for example, is relying heavily on digital control systems to operate their assets. We know from comments by May Balqueda themselves that they're going to exploit vulnerabilities wherever they can find them. One area could be, in some cases, to exploit the vulnerabilities of cyberspace to produce certain kinds of harms that hitherto, prior to the information age, will only be achieved through physical destruction. What we've been focusing on at the Chow is largely bringing this to the attention of, of senior management and trying to make the case as a business proposition that it makes good sense to secure their infrastructures. It's important both for the nation, but it's also important as a matter of, matter of corporate governance and the rest. Once you start getting into the areas of regulatory issues regarding the safety and security of the nuclear power plants themselves. That's an area that we leave to the NRC, and that's why I made the comment I made earlier. Well, and, and that's the reason for my question is I, I haven't seen a lot of information thus far, and we are in the first week since the announcement um, be, regarding the NRC's, how it fits into critical infrastructure protection. And with two nuclear power plants uh, bordering my district, certainly to my sure. residents, uh, that infrastructure, uh, those plants, 
um, and the security of them are, are uh, you know, kind of very paramount in, in my constituents' thoughts. But there is an overarching division within the Homeland Security, the proposed Homeland Security uh, Department, which would deal with nuclear countermeasures and the risks posed thereby. And I would suggest to you, and I would be more than happy to, to take up the appropriate co my appropriate colleagues in this area to get back to you on this matter. That would be great, and, and, sure. and maybe to the, the chairman for the whole committee and, and share whatever information at this point, I, again, it being early in the announcement, sure. but whatever information that can be shared on that specific aspect of infrastructure protection regarding yeah. the security of the plants, I'd welcome that. Although I would like to add one point just for the record on this. In creating the Department of Homeland Security, it was never envisioned that all aspects of Homeland Security would fall under one roof. There's still a vital role that's going to be played by various departments and agencies in areas that relate to Homeland Security that do not come under the specific organizational structure of the Homeland Security. Uh, oh. Protection of nuclear power plants undoubtedly is going to be, continue to be a major issue. And I know for a fact, having uh, in, been involved in a numerous Homeland Security Department uh, uh, office uh, policy committee meetings, that this is a paramount concern. Uh, the, uh, the point about not this new department covering every aspect I, I is well taken, but um, I think the, the intent is certainly to ensure a comprehensive approach, and given the threat level of an attack on one of our nuclear facilities, making sure they're well in the loop of the intelligence being shared, the information that the law enforcement community, sure. everybody has, um, seems to, to argue pretty strongly that NRC be integrally involved in this new Department of Homeland Security. I have no doubt that the concerns about the nuclear power plants are, are, are a component part of the Homeland Security Department. I guess the answer I want to give you is as it relates to the NRC and how that's going to be worked out is the piece that I cannot give you and, at this time. And, and, and uh, given we're a weekend, that's uh, understandable. The second question is uh, actually uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Beecraft on um, communications and, and, and the focus of this realignment being better sharing of intelligence, better sharing of information in general. And, and we had the, uh, the very unfortunate uh, disbursement of the student visa six months after the attacks um, regarding the terrorists involved. And, and are, are you comfortable or do you, you believe that this realignment will ensure better communications? And was that a problem with those student visa being issued? Um, that the information not being shared between agencies or within even one agency, INS, that communications uh, failures was uh, the culprit there? Uh, Congressman, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to this because I think it needs some clarification. It has been portrayed that, in fact, visas were approved and, uh, and, and forwarded uh, after the fact. In fact, those two adjustments of status, of the current status that those two individuals, Anwar al she and, uh, uh, oh, God, name just, Atta. right, Atta, um, those were approved back in July and August of last year. What took place on the 11th of March was a contractor's responsibility to send the notification, like a canceled check, to Huffman Aviation to, for their files. It was unfortunate that that went out. It never should have gone out. And it was a problem in, in communications within the agency. But it was not an after a fact approval of uh, adjustment of status for these two individuals. That was done before September 11th based sure. on the information that the State Department, the CIA, the FBI, and INS had at the time? The, um, I guess, two part. One is, um, despite it not being the approval, sure. but still a notification about somebody who's attacked our citizens and, and, and uh, taken the lives of our citizens, clearly still a, a failure of the system that, that wasn't caught. Um, but, but also as to the information that was made on the original decision, um, I would assume that the intent of this restructuring is that you have better information that those visas uh, would not have been approved uh, or the adjustment of status would not have been approved uh, in the first place if, if you had had a big... If we had, if we had information, uh, intelligence information that would indicate to us that these people should not have been approved, 
that hopefully would have happened at that point. But I think it's on record. We don't have any information to that fact. Clearly, uh, the President's initiative uh, to pull these organizations together and the attention that 9-11 has brought to the whole issue of information sharing between law enforcement agencies and the intelligence agencies hopefully will preclude anything like this from happening again. There are no guarantees in life, but we certainly are a much smarter organization today and a much smarter group of people sitting at this table than we were, uh, you know, nine months ago, ten months ago. Uh, and, and that is because we have pushed hard, and we have been pushed hard. We've been pushed hard by people like you on this issue uh, to ensure that we, uh, you know, improve the way we do business. Is, is it uh, safe to say or accurate to say that part of what we're trying to do with the restructuring, and, and I well embrace the President's proposal, I think it uh, is yes, a well sir. thought out proposal, is that, that we will kind of institutionalize the information sharing that's now occurring eight, nine months after the attacks, and, and it's still fresh in our minds, so that two years, three years, five years from now, when we hopefully have been more attack-free, that we still are well sharing information, not because of the vivid nature of September 11th, but because uh, it's absolutely. the norm. I, I totally agree with you. I think this focuses all the appropriate agencies on the issue at hand, and uh, they're going to stay focused. There isn't anyone in the Department of Defense doesn't understand what their mission is, and that's because they have a unique organization over there with the Secretary of Defense and civilian leadership that keeps them very focused on the mission, mm -hmm. and they have a uniformed service that understands its duty. Uh, this will bring uh, all of these organizations together, put them under one helm, and uh, ensure uh, that we're talking to each other on a daily basis. Thank you, Commissioner. I, if I can squeeze in one more, or do you want me to wait? You know what? You can squeeze in another one. Without question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You used very little time the first time. <laughs> um, a follow-up, uh, Admiral Collins, to really the, the questions from Mr. Schrock and Mr. Souder on the uh, and the scenario of your new mission being Homeland Security and how that relates to search and rescue and, and the scenario he gave with the sailboat capsizing. Um, I guess the, the concern is of saving money versus needing more money for adding to your priority missions is if uh, that sailboat, your, your reaction, it would be an instantaneous decision, save the lives, the lives of those at risk, but not knowing if it was an intentional capsizing of that ship to pull you away from your other duty, Homeland Security, it seems that um, without some additional resources, you're already strained given what we give you and, and underfunded, that you, if you go and save the lives as that priority, that other very important uh, assignment is going to be at risk of not being able to w be well fulfilled. Uh, again, clearly it's a, it's a little bit of a balancing act amongst the, the resources allocated across our missions. I, I might say that, again, with the help of the 02 supplemental and the, zero, and the 03 budget, we are providing additional presence on the waterways of this country, a port and a ports and waterways. There's, through 03, there will be six maritime safety and security teams. There's the teams of about 70 active duty, about 30 reserves that will be positioned around the country to surge into areas to provide those kind of augmentation for uh, high prof profile, high op tempo type activities. That's a good thing. Uh, in addition, there is a, both in the 02 budget and the 03 budget additional resources going into our search and rescue stations. Uh, and there's additional resources to buy small boats uh, for these marine safety, uh, maritime safety and security teams and, and, and uh, SAR stations. Uh, so, and I might, I might also offer that those SAR stations are typically, have, we've called them search and rescue stations, they're multi-mission stations, and they do law enforcement in, in addition to search and rescue. So the, the bottom line here, I think there's recognition both in Congress and in the administration that the enhanced presence uh, in the ports and waterways of this country uh, is an important thing. Uh, and we're building that capability, uh, and in the meantime, as we build that out, uh, we will, will, from a risk-based perspective, allocate the resources, uh, resources accordingly. Uh, clearly, there's linkage between, as I mentioned earlier, there's great linkage between the counter drug mission and, and illegal behavior of all types, including terrorism. It, it's the cash cow, if you will, to, f to fuel illegal behavior. Uh, and, and, and that, that particular 
uh, mission is, I think, remains a very fundamentally important one uh, and figures material in the new, uh, from my perspective, in the new Office of uh, Homeland Security is one of those fundamental missions that both INS Customs and the Coast Guard in particular uh, and the Border Patrol are, are very much tuned into and we'll, we'll continue to do that. Uh, and where, the, where we have the information and the intel to trigger action and allocation of assets, uh, that, that's, that's what we'll do. And as we get better, on the awareness side, as we get better on the awareness side with good intelligence, good uh, movement of information, actionable intel, fused intel, which this new Office of Homeland Security will give us, we'll get, get better on a lot of fronts. Stopping the bad and allowing the good to come through. Mm -hmm. Stopping the bad and allowing the good to come through. So you, you service a mobility function and efficiency function and stopping the bad at the same time. Thank you, Emmer Collins, and uh, again, I thank each of you and uh, your various colleagues in your department's agencies for uh, your work day in and day out trying to protect our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The, um, this is an excellent panel, uh, and we could spend time with just each and every one of you as a separate entity, uh, but there is uh, importance in, in having seven of you, but you, the seven of you are only part of the hundred that we see in those cards, <coughs> admittedly, probably a more important part. I mean, we took some of the bigger uh, changes. Um, but as I'm sitting here, there are so many things that I want to ask. I, I think of the uh, United States Coast Guard uh, and INS and Customs. I mean, I think of Customs as making sure bad things don't get into this country and that people pay for the things that come in that they're supposed to. I think of the, the INS as making sure those who come should be allowed to come uh, and those who shouldn't uh, should be stopped and we catch them and so on and we process it well and we keep track of who's here and who isn't. People, things. I think of the Coast Guard as how you interface with both of them. And yet, um, as we talk, I, I, I realize that you all interact, but we've been to conferences where we've talked about this and there's a lot of, of competition in some cases. Uh, criticism uh, from one agency to another and and hopefully uh, as you uh, find yourself part of one entity obviously you're part of one entity the United States but working more closely together uh, some of the um, uh, of the disconnects will will disappear I also think of the FBI and think of uh, of how the FBI is primarily intelligent in investigative and that it was primarily domestic. Now when we go overseas, obviously we interact with the FBI who are involved in catching uh, foreign uh, funds and uh, involved in a number of other things overseas that impact us domestically. But the CIA, we didn't want them to come into the United States. We didn't want that intelligence component there. And the discontent of an intelligence agency involved in gathering intelligence and analyzing and interacting with the with the culture of the FBI, which is basically evidence gathering. You are doing what we asked you to do over decades. Curious about the FBI, with the cyber division, does that come over? Does the FBI in a sense lose it or does it stay with the FBI and then is this Department of Homeland Security going to use you uh, are they going to be a customer of yours? Uh, yeah, Congressman, that's correct. But essentially, the cyber division would entail the criminal investigative national security responsibilities of the FBI, the counterterrorism, the counterintelligence, and the criminal uh, role that the FBI has as our core mission. And it will still stay in the FBI? Remain in the FBI, and then we will feed the information and the intel to the new agency. Okay. So uh, you basically come under the blue component, that's right. Um, when I, I look at customs, do we think of customs as the, um, we, when we divided, let me back up, when we look at INS, we kind of in, in, uh, in Congress have divided you into two parts. Do you think of you, uh, do you think of your operation as being divided into two parts? How do you view it? Um, <clears throat> as you know, Put the mic uh, a little closer and turn it on, please. It's amazing. You hardly need the mic. Right. Okay. Um, as I stated in my in my opening statement, we have been looking to reorganize this agency for years, and we are we're focusing on uh, splitting enforcement and services. That has been part of the game plan. I mean, we're delighted to see the president's plan 
uh, that in a sense does that. It takes, as we can tell right now from what we know of the plan, it takes uh, our law enforcement uh, elements, the Border Patrol uh, inspections, probably investigations, and I'm sure there'll be some discussion of this, but I would see those things ending up in the Border Security uh, Division up here. Immigration services is also a critical part of it, and I would refer back to Mr. Platt's uh, discussion with me about, uh, you know, the, the two uh, terrorists, Marwan al shahi and Mohammed Atta. Um, that shows that there is a critical linkage here between benefits and the enforcement side. Right. There is room for great fraud in the benefit side of the but, business. But all of INS comes under. All of INS goes under. And would it all be under uh, the uh, first? Did it be in the green? All under. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, when I look at customs, should I think of customs, not having spent the time that others have on this committee with customs, should I view it as being able to divide under the same services, revenue, uh, and um, basically enforcement to three parts? How would I, how would I view uh, Actually, customs? I would say it, it, the, the Is your mic on? The, the, I believe it's on, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Actually, I'd say the three pieces are so closely intertwined that I, you, we look at them as one piece in the organization. Um, the revenue part of what we do, that is collecting revenues that are then turned over to the Treasury Department, in our judgment, would not be affected by this realignment. That is still, still something we could do and then turn the revenue collections over to the and, Treasury and, Department. And let me just use this as a point. In the President's presentation in their uh, booklet that they provided, they had on page four, they made this comment under non-homeland security functions. The new department would have a number of functions that are not directly related to securing the homeland against terrorism. For instance, through F, uh, FEMA, it would be responsible for mitigating the effects of natural disasters and so on. And so you, this is an example. The collection of funds would not be related to homeland security, but since the other parts are there, makes sense, and you still could carry it on. And, and actually, because we, the way we've built our mission, those pieces are so connected that it would be very, very difficult to separate them out and still maintain the efficiency with which we're currently doing it. And so in that sense, we were very happy when the proposal had the entire custom service with all of our mission responsibilities going over. You will recall at the beginning of my statement that I said we had been a law enforcement agency for quite some period of time, and we have managed to balance both of those responsibilities, the trade piece, our law enforcement, border security, and compliance pieces fairly well. And indeed, I think our, our trade is very comfortable with that. One other point I would raise, Mr. Chairman, one of the concerns that has always been raised with us by the trade is the need to have a single face on this process. Mm -hmm. If you take these functions and you bifurcate these functions, then what you do is you don't realize the economies of scale that you're talking about here. You have the trade having to go to customs to do examinations and inspections and somewhere else to do something else. You just triggered something that I had wanted to ask as well. Uh, when, when you're going on board a ship for potentially looking at people who aren't here legally, that would be INS enforcement uh, or not? It, would it be customs? I mean, you're looking at products. I mean, we're smiling. Tell me the well, smile. I, I'm only smiling because there is actually an awful lot of synergy that already exists between our two organizations. Right. If you take what happens at a port of entry, for example, on the southern northern border, you could have a customs officer at the booth or you could have an INS officer at the booth because we're across designated to carry out those functions. Right. Same situation at the international airports. INS will conduct So our, there's real logic to this part. There is a lot of logic to yeah. this. They do our primaries, we do the secondaries. There's an awful lot of logic. And in fact, when Congressman Putnam asked me the question, and I didn't want to be, uh, uh, I hope not flippant with my response to you, when you say, can we do our job better? We really should be able to do our job better. Because in fact, we're going to have the benefit of the resources that we've been working with for years so that we can put it under a unified command and get a unified result. One other point, I'm thinking back to Admiral Collins' point about uh, what happens in that situation where he's got to make a decision between a SAR rescue and whether he goes out after uh, a law enforcement initiative. Uh, arguably in a new agency where you have customs assets and our close-in assets, our interceptors in the marine environment are very good. Deep water is what the Coast Guard does very, very well. So arguably, we ought to be able to communicate with each other and say, we need your assistance, have the mechanisms in place to make sure that assistance is available, and be able to respond in a host of different areas, not just 
border security, not just anti-terrorism, but also the other core missions that we have, search and rescue, trade facilitation and compliance, and immigration uh, activities. Let me just say, I'm going to recognize Mr. Putnam and then Mr. Sauter and then come back. Uh, we, the second round, there'll be less members and we'll probably be able to get you out here pretty soon. But what I'm going to want to talk to you about, uh, Mr. Accord, is, is the issue of um, your agency within uh, the Department of Agriculture is being removed from the Department of Agriculture. I want to, I want to know what the cultural implication of that is. Um, I am intrigued, and I will just preface my, and I'm, I'm going to have you respond uh, when I have my second round, but I'm intrigued by the yellow component. When we had been looking at this for, for a number of years, the chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear countermeasures, um, there was a big weakness in the other plans that didn't involve this whole, you know, this, this um, a focus. Um, and when we, when I chaired the Human Resource Subcommittee, we, we began to look at things like uh, mad cow disease. It was basically <laughs> under agriculture. We decided to have a hearing because it affected human health, though we didn't have jurisdiction about animals. When we started to have this hearing, we had everyone from the cattle industry rightfully say, tread carefully, you could alarm people, uh, and you could disrupt a multi-billion dollar business, which got us thinking uh, when we then became, uh, when I became chairman of this committee, just incredible um, opportunity a terrorist has to do terrorism against our livestock and so on, and the disruption that would cause. I, I look forward, Mr. Bauman, to talking to you about the relationship of the state and local uh, participants, because we're going to be drawing in parts of justice uh, and HHS into grants to first responders, which I again think is a pretty uh, interesting way that, that the, the, the White House is looking to to um, kind of bring these parts together. Uh, but I can wait, and I'll uh, give Mr. Putnam uh, the opportunity to ask uh, one last round of 10 minutes. I mean, I say last round, but it probably will be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just since, just between rounds, I've been jotting down the different things that we look for in our borders. Obviously, there's a, you know, in the waterways, there's a search and rescue component. But in border security, we're looking for, for terrorists, drugs, immigration. Uh, we have Fish and Wildlife Station looking for the trafficking of endangered species, uh, ag plant pests and disease issues, trade enforcement, uh, the revenue side, fee tax, tariff type issues, uh, ordinary crimes, larceny, things like that, and, and firearms. And, and all of you are, to varying degrees, part of that puzzle. So I'm curious, prior to September the 11th, how often, how many times had all of you met one another or worked with one another or engaged in a conference with each other on how to better protect our border prior to September 11th? Um, well, let me give an initial stab. I, I think there's been uh, a history of uh, close coordination uh, and uh, from Washington all the way down to the field level. When I, I was in the West Coast, uh, close rapport with with INS and Customs in the West Coast to deal with issues that, that oftentimes we do joint boardings together on ships uh, to, to take advantage of our res respective expertise. Uh, we know about compartmentation and dangers and safety issues aboard ship. Uh, we, we, we scrutinize, we have advance notice of arrival and, and, uh, from vessels coming in the United States and scrutinize them against databases that our partners maintain. Uh, and so forth. Uh, on, the, on counter drugs, uh, there has been a, jo a joint interagency type approach to a counter drug efforts for a number of years. I think that's gotten better. It's gotten better and better each year in terms of the coordination. We maintain joint interagency task force east and west. It's an interagency group uh, in Key West, in the West Coast, uh, all, jointly, all jointly manned. So I think there's great example. We could go on. I think there's great examples of partnerships across the board, and the, and the, re the reorganization will for, will build on that. I, th I you, you do a wonderful job at JADF East and JADF West, but how many times have you guys at this table met with one another prior to September the 11th? I, I, I don't know about the individuals, but as far as agencies, uh, our agency meets routinely, probably once a month, with many of the agencies here. Uh, 
Coast Guard under the role in, under the National Contingency Plan for hazardous materials. Uh, we've supported INS in immigration emergencies and doing some planning there. Uh, APHIS in foot, foot mouth disease, when that, there was an outbreak there last year, we were working with them to do state level planning. So we we have on a number so of occasions. Based on the first two answers, at the highest levels, all of our future deputy assistant secretaries of the Department of Homeland Security had never met. <laughs> I'd like to say I've, I've worked with uh, Admiral Collins and with uh, Bruce Bauman uh, for probably 10 years now. And uh, those are the type of relations. And they were on critical issues. They were on w way back before I got to INS in the drug business. Okay, Tom and I knew each other. Um, Mr. Bauman and I uh, were intimately involved in the uh, uh, post-Haitian, uh, you know, Cuban crisis uh, in uh, 1994. I mean, we have working relationships. We have a, a Coast Guard liaison officer, a Customs liaison officer. We have people over in those organizations. I mean, that's, uh, that's surviving in business today. Uh, it, is, it is reality. And uh, for, for example, for Customs and INS, um, I'll admit it, there's been tension there over the years. Okay, there's always a little turf battle when you're located in the same little, uh, little uh, you know, uh, port of entry. But the, the bottom line is, is that we cannot survive together or independently without working together. And uh, that has been a reality. And, and it's been a working reality. Uh, Congressman, I've only been on this, in this job about 30 days, but I can tell you that my predecessor had an awful lot of contact with these folks and everything yeah. that's being said here is true. Um, I think what this reorganization is really gonna do is build on some of the good relationships that have in many instances been the byproduct of, of folks in the same location with the, with the same objective, <clears throat> developing those relationships that allow them to pull their organizations together and make things happen. And I think this, this or reorganization is going to provide us with a framework, an institutional framework in which we can sort of move this process even a step further. Let me change gears a little bit. Uh, Admiral, if, if our airport security was as outstanding as Coast Guard, there's a lot of this discussion we probably wouldn't even be having. You do an outstanding job. During peacetime, you probably have a much higher percentage of your personnel in harm's way on a daily basis than our other uniformed services. And for my state, you are our first line of defense from a whole host of, of threats. You mentioned three stipulations, uh, concerns that you had about the, uh, about the new department. I only caught the first one, which was, if you're going to transfer us, please transfer us in, a, in entirety. Could you please repeat the, the next two, because I was a little bit slow. Sure. The, yeah, the first one was the transfer intact in whole. And I think you can tell by the, by the diagram there, labeled U.S. Coast Guard, uh, and it's expressly stated within the, the, uh, the, the information put up by the White House that, in fact, is the case. Uh, check. Uh, check. Second, we maintain our military multi-mission maritime characteristics. I think that the, the taxpayer of the United States and the public gets a great deal of benefit from the combination of those attributes. And they've matured over 212 years, and they've, I think they've served the nation very, very well. Uh, uh, we would like to see those remain intact. And, and everything, information that we received uh, on this issue, that is, in fact, the case. Okay. Uh, the military in particular, we have we have uh, extensive partnerships with the Department of Defense, the United States Navy, uh, written into many of their plans. Uh, we have uh, Coast Guard units right now in Gitmo, in the Persian Gulf, uh, providing niche area support services uh, in partnerships with the Department of Defense. That's terribly important. It's a good stewardship issue. Uh, that should, that's, going, that's going to continue. Uh, and the third is that we fully support the full range of our a full range of our, our missions that we've talked about here today, that we still pursue uh, the search and rescue mission. We still, uh, environmental, uh, marine environment, environmental protection is still an important issue to the nation. Oh, by the way, an environmental uh, catastrophe may, may happen as a result of a terrorist act. So these things, there is linkage. Uh, but all those, all those uh, missions remain critical uh, missions to uh, the national security of the United States. 
And as I mentioned, in the 1999 Presidential Interagency Task Force uh, confirmed and validated the essential nature of those missions. So I, I, I think we're in good standing on all those features, and this proposal uh, uh, addresses them very, very adequately. Thank, thank you, Admiral. Commissioner Browning, if you don't know the answer to this, I understand, but it's a sister agency under Treasury. Could, could you please explain to me what role Secret Service has, because they appear to be on a different function plane, but they're the same color. So, and if you don't know the answer, I understand. I'll get it. But actually, uh, Congressman, I know no more than what was in the the documents that were put out. Um, yes, sir. I, I know no more than what was put out in the documents about why Secret Service was pulled into that. Okay. And as part of your customs function at our ports, when you are tracking illegal firearm shipments, I assume that's an ATF issue. Or that is correct. And they would have some engagement in that. That's correct. Is there, a, is there a rationale for transferring all or a portion of ATF into the new department? Um, actually, um, the, the ATF mission is a domestic mission. Uh, as to why they were not transferred over as part of this process, I don't know. But, but clearly, with respect to the border, there would be a handoff for customs to ATF uh, if there were a smuggling activity or uh, arms were tried to, to be imported without the appropriate license, we would do the interdiction, we would turn it over to the, the regulatory agency for them to make the disposition on what ultimately would happen. But other than that, I have no, no sense, no real sense about the inner discussion as to why, okay. where ATF lands in this process. Mr. Acord, I, I fully believe in, in this plan. But I do have some strong concerns about transferring all of APHIS. I believe that there is a very strong case to be made for having a unified border security agency involving all of the people who are here, a, a, a foot wide, if you will, around the nation. But once, for example, with APHIS, a plant, pest, or disease is introduced, I feel like USDA possesses the expertise to conduct the quarantine, eradication, education, and, and control functions better than the Department of Homeland Security. I wouldn't want the Department of Homeland Security distracted by citrus canker in Florida or by the pink hibiscus mealybug, and I wouldn't want to think of where those two issues would fall on the priority list in a Department of Homeland Security. Is there a is there a functional way to split off functions to reflect those concerns? Well, Congressman, I think if, if, if you look at transferring you know, all of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which this plan does, then we move those functions and those responsibilities with the organization. You know, we draw from uh, uh, for emergency program operations, we draw from the domestic uh, uh, field force from our veterinarians. Uh, if we're uh, uh, doing it on the uh, on the plant side, we look to the uh, you know plant protection and quarantine officers to uh, you know as a source of of uh, people to staff those emergency uh, response teams. And I think you know that points out the you know the need for the uh, uh, you know for the the transfer intact in as it's proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Souter. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Commissioner uh, Browning, would, would you agree that um, since Customs is being moved into the Department of Homeland Security, that now you're, that's your, your multi-mission, but that's your number one mission? Um, actually, I, I would say since September 11th, um, Congressman, that's been our number one priority. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, the other core mission requirements, um, working with the trade to, to, to have of them assist us in shoring up supply chain security, uh, we haven't lost focus of that. Uh, I think probably for the foreseeable future, um, counterterrorism is going to be the number one priority of all the agencies here. Uh, but I don't think that means we can't continue to also uh, merge that responsibility of border security with the other core mission of the organization. Um, um, it's going to be a challenge, but I think it's one we've, we've indicated we're capable of, uh, of addressing. 
would everybody at the table agree that uh, at least for your divisions that are being transferred in, uh, that that's now your number one mission is Homeland Security? Uh, even I certainly if you can. have other. Because that's, that's going to be one of the difficult things for us to work through and has been the historic trade-off uh, both for commerce and customs at the border is economic security or homeland security uh, in the process of how much checking, how fast people move through the border. And what Congress needs to understand is if we've somewhat altered the mission since uh, your, your priority mission since 9-11, uh, because this occurred at 9-11, there was no question that it, it, there was a shift at the borders, which is why there's a longer backup, even though there's fewer people crossing. Uh, that um, in most places it's closer to normal now, but we also have less traffic. Uh, that um, uh, if that mission is changed, if Congress wants to make sure that we're keeping the commerce moving, then we have to put adequate border crossings, adequate bridges, adequate personnel, adequate pay at those borders, or we're in fact going to change our economic security. In a pickup in Fort Wayne, Indiana, there are 100 border crossings involved. There are 1,400 nurses who cross daily at Windsor, and when we backed it up for a number of hours at Detroit, the Detroit hospitals didn't have staff. And that we have to understand here that there isn't just shuffling people on the deck, which I would agree with Mr. Browning's point earlier. You all have been doing this for some time. We in Congress may not have realized that. But this is more acknowledging what's been happening and accelerating that pace. So it's, it's not like we're making a huge step of progress here. We're more acknowledging and, and now going, going to, in Congress and our appropriations process, acknowledge this. But this isn't, uh, uh, if we're going to keep our multi-mission tasks, this is not going to, to be done without a change in dollars, because since 9-11, we changed the missions of many of your agencies as far as what was your primary. The primary mission of Coast Guard was not Homeland Security prior to 9-11, or Customs, or Commerce, or Ag, or FEMA. Um, uh, for example, uh, that uh, if you have a, a trade-off in FEMA between a hurricane and a tornado, or a fairly high risk threat, how do you, in other words, you're in the risk assessment business, but, but how, how does this alter your trade-off calculations even in preparation? Uh, that, that those are, are things that we have to take into consideration for, for our constituents um, and, and understand that there isn't a cheap way out of this. Let me, let me address one of the Border Patrol questions. My understanding is, uh, as of at least two, uh, it might be three weeks ago now, that 40 percent of the Border Patrol agents on the south border have applied to be sky marshals or other positions. In other words, we in Congress are talking about beefing up our, our Border Patrol, and yet our pay levels on the Border Patrol and the job satisfaction is such that we can't hardly hold the people we have. Their reorganization isn't going to address that question. We have a fundamental challenge. Uh, it's uh, very true, Congressman, that we are we're really bleeding when it comes to uh, retaining uh, our qualified, experienced people in the Border Patrol. Uh, we're all in competition with each other right now. We're in competition with the Transportation Security Agency, which seems to be drawing off uh, the majority of the people that are leaving. And uh, it, it's a very critical issue. Last year, the INS uh, recruited, uh, it was a banner year. We had to hire 4,000 people, and we did it. This year, uh, we have to hire 8,000 people. That's what it was at the beginning of the fiscal year. Right now, given attrition, we're looking at having to, fire, or to hire 10,500 people in order to get the numbers, to recruit and get the numbers that we think we, we will get. Whether or not we come in close to that number is doubtful. I mean, I, I must tell you, I figure we're going to come in somewhere at 6,000 or below. Uh, but we're competing amongst ourselves. Uh, right now, the, the uh, you know, journeyman level for a Border Patrol is a GS-9. We'd like to get that up to a GS-11. We're working with the administration, uh, and we're working very well with the administration on that issue. Uh, but there are tough calls and tough decisions that have to be made. But clearly, if you want to put qualified, experienced people on the line, we've got to be able to compete with our, uh, you know, sister agencies. And if we're going to talk about Homeland Security and the Civil Service Subcommittee, uh, as, as well as others, we need to look at some of those questions, or, we, or what it looks like is we've come up with a political solution and we haven't really given you the means with which to deliver. Now, one of the uh, effectiveness uh, 
uh, questions that I, I think that the chairman and I were, were talking about is, is that, that some of your synergism is, is occurring currently, but in these different teams, um, uh, hopefully this will help resolve some difficult questions because we in Congress haven't resolved this, nor have you in your agencies. For example, the Border Patrol mission is to patrol the border, but Customs often wants to let somebody get through so we can figure out the network and watch where the next point is. This really becomes critical in southern Arizona where we've had hearings and in upstate New York where the goal is are we going to catch people back at a transportation cross point as they move through the different things or are we going to be at the border? And many members of Congress who represent the general population in that area don't want to come back off the border because then many of their constituents are, are going through who may not even be crossing the border. And we in Congress, when we talk about, hey, we want to do a homeland agency, um, need to understand that th there's actually some political consequences to this because you all who've been working inside your agencies now theoretically are going to have a supervisor who can resolve some of the dis differences and force us to make some tough decisions here in Congress because Homeland Security is not just one, I mean, there are multiple ways to look at this. If I can ask one other uh, direct question on the INS question, that when we deal in our personal offices, and often uh, I think every member of Congress was panicked that one of our offices had called and cleared one of those people uh, because somebody called us and one of our constituents, uh, because all of us call all the time for visa waivers uh, or acceleration. The Department of State, I don't believe, is in this. Are they in the INS clearances? And how does, how does it work? Um, w w and how do you perceive that we could in do that better as far as uh, the intelligence that relates to these different students are often included in an embassy, then they come into our system, and it's unclear to me how this is going to work if we don't have the, the, the clearance at the host country organized in this. Well, I, I must say that uh, we don't have all the details on how that's going to work based upon the documentation that we've received thus far on the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but, but clearly, your, your point is well taken. We've got to do it. As we've said earlier on the issue of cargo and goods coming to the United States, we need to reach and push our borders out and reach out and check that stuff as far away as possible. Uh, visa officers, consular affairs officers in embassies around the world need to have the resources and the assets, the intelligence available to them to make those conscious decisions as far away as possible. Now, how that process will change and work in the future based on this plan, I can't tell you. I'm sure there'll be great discussion between the State Department and INS and the Department of Homeland Security and, and the Office of Homeland Security. But the message clearly has been, and I've stated it here before, in fact, to you, uh, that our goal is to push that as far away as possible with the proper intelligence, the proper law enforcement information behind us, so that the decisions are made before these people get here. And I, I want to, again, commend each of you, and I know we're going to have lots more hearings before we get to the uh, end, I'm, I'm sure, in each of our committees. And the, the difficulty uh, and the idea that, that um, uh, we're going to get great economies of scale. I think we'll get efficiency, and I think as the terrorists get better, we have to get better, and that's really what we're trying to do here. But uh, if I can go back to, because Sweetgrass is the last crossing I was at, I was up in Vancouver and then crossed over at Sweetgrass, it illustrates the complexity of the border because there is an ag department presence there, but there's a veterinarian and he's just one guy. It's not like you can separate his functions. He, he is checking for uh, hoof and mouth disease and other types of things as they say. That's one of the biggest border crossings in the United States. If, if if not the biggest, for dead and live meat, as they say, uh, that um, because of the uh, Calgary and, and Montana back and, back and forth. So you have one vet guy there who doesn't have the ability to, to split his functions, and he's looking for both type of things. He also found the biggest uh, drug bust that Customs had identified somebody at risk over in Vancouver, and they found 1,200 pounds of BC bud that sells for higher in Boston and New York than cocaine, and for almost as high in San Francisco in a peat moss load, uh, which was a Department of Agri it was headed to the Department of Agriculture, but the Customs guy caught him, and otherwise it would have just gone through as an ag load. Uh, in the back part of that border, which is one of the main ones where we're doing back checking, they're finding arms deals dealers coming across. So it would have been ATF coming in the United States, but Customs catches them at the border because they're arms dealers and they initially catch them because of licensing. In other words, trying to split this stuff up 
um, is difficult. But we also need to realize that this is only a partial agency because you're so interconnected in the domestic and ultimately with the border teams. And it, I believe it's a step in the right direction, but we've got lots of details to look through here. And having had six hearings so far on the border and a bend about uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 crossings now in north and south, uh, we are doing a lot. And there's, there's already a lot of synergy there. And I don't think we're going to find a lot of cost savings, but I believe to be more effective, we need to be willing to invest this so we don't kill our commerce in the process of improving our homeland security. I yield back to the chairman and thank you for this hearing. I thank the gentleman. Um, do you, Ms. Schotter, will you have other questions to ask or Mr. Putnam? Do you, have, do you have some? You can, we have time if you want. Okay, well. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I haven't allowed you to use the facilities. That if you got another 15 minutes uh, or so, I think we can get you out of here. Um, I want to understand, Mr. Tritak, your position a bit more and what your uh, agency does, sure. and then then I'll be able to answer the uh, ask the question. But what I'm wondering, before you even describe it, is you're going under the information analysis and infrastructure protection part. Right. Are you being captured entirely yes. as a unit, so you're not <laughs> providing a service? You're going to be in that unit yes. consuming. Uh, services provided by other agencies. Is that yeah. correct? Actually, you know, in, in many respects, perhaps more more commonly from, uh, similar to the NIPC, is we were created out of whole cloth specifically to address the problem of critical infrastructure assurance. Wait, slow down a second. You were printed on a what? Oh, I'm sorry. We were created, we were created anew in 1998 by okay. presidential directive to deal with a very specific series of set of problems that were identified by a presidential commission for critical infrastructure protection. Gotcha. The idea was you needed to have an office that would coordinate across national outreach and awareness efforts to the private sector, which is a major stakeholder in all this. And I know that we haven't got too much into that, but we all understand that's, like, that's the case. And there were a number of other issues that needed to be addressed. And the question is, well, where do you put it? And the original proposal was, well, let's put it in the White House. And for a variety of reasons, the commission and the administration had decided that probably wasn't the best way to, place so, to put it. So you're in commerce. You're going to the Department Correct. of Homeland Security. Right. And describe to me what you, your tasks will be within that area. Well, I think what, what the Homeland Security Department wants is to basically bring the functions we've been performing over there so they were performed in one place and also to combine them with similar efforts that are taking place elsewhere. The big one being outreach and awareness and to engage the private sector, number one. Number two, we have an effort underway called Project Matrix, which was designed to help agencies identify their critical assets and their dependencies on infrastructure within the federal government to better help prioritize where you put your dollars in terms of, of securing uh, key functions in the federal government. And then the third is to help facilitate the development of a national strategy. And those were the, the, the uh, issues or the functions that were assigned to the Chow in 1998 by presidential directive. And since the Bush administration has taken over, they, we've also been asked to house an inf information integration program office that basically will help identify information sharing needs and exploit high technology, information technology, to better facilitate the sharing of data across federal governments. That's a proposal that's in the 03 okay. budget. Fine. Okay. What, what the proposal for Homeland Security is to take that function, everything we've been doing, and put it in the Office of Homeland Security. And that makes sense? That makes sense. It does make sense. And, and you, you all can We that. fully support it. Okay. And the Secretary of Commerce does as well. Mr. Mefford, I just want to just be sure that I'm clear that your part of the FBI remains in the FBI, but you will be providing a service to this customer, the Department of Homeland Security. So yeah, that's un unlike... Mr. Tritak, you won't be gob you won't be part of the department. You will be providing a service to it. My understanding is that we have to work out the specific details, but in concept, that's correct. Okay. The the interagency process of the NIPC, which is basically they've prioritized prevention and mitigation of attacks on the information infrastructure and the physical infrastructure of the country. The process of of analyzing and and. Con uh, conducting the watch and warning mission, which is basically advising uh, potential victims and mitigating the attacks, uh, that process and the interagency process would be moved over to the new agency. 
the FBI would continue our core mission to investigate criminal violations of federal law and to address our national security responsibilities. That's my understanding today. So when you say moved over to the agency, still under the auspices of the, of the FBI, or will it be part of the agency, be part of the new department? That's what I'm trying to just Right, and, and we still have to work out the details. Obviously, we're in the early stages. Preliminarily, we're looking at uh, it, the responsibility for the NIPC being assumed by the new department. Gotcha. Okay. So that we can basically work closer with such agencies as Commerce and, and GSA and others that do a similar function. Very good. Uh, getting to uh, you, Mr. Accord, I just um, I want to be clear. We aren't asking. I, I I look at the pathogens that attack us, and some of them can be naturally um, uh, initiated, and others could be initiated. Uh, artificially by, by terrorist activities. One of the most horrific uh, testimony our committee had was, our last question traditionally is, is there anything we should have asked you? Uh, a noted doctor of, the, of, the, um, of a major medical magazine said, my biggest fear is a small group of scientists, dedicated scientists who will create um, a, um, a virus, altered virus, that will have no antidote and it will wipe out humanity as we know it. That same fear is basically uh, exists uh, in the animal world as well. And you will be part of Homeland Security. Is there any doubt in your mind, though, that you would not pay attention to the natural uh, attacks that would uh, face our livestock as well as the uh, terrorists generated? I think that gets back to the uh, uh, you know, to the comment that uh, you know, Congressman Souter made earlier about where the priorities are. Our priorities have always been to prevent the entry of, of foreign animal and plant diseases. No but matter no matter what the generator of it is. That's that's exactly right. We okay. we try to whether it's it's you know, we 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 try to stay on top of all of the. You know, potential pathways that uh, you know that may exist uh, uh, <coughs> that c where they can gain access to this country, and we try to maintain uh, you know access to the latest science to make sure that we understand what the risks are and how they can be transmitted. At the same time, I think it's important to recognize that we have another very important priority, and that's to maintain you know the health of our herds and flocks and the and the crops that we have in this country because that's fundamental to our success at trade. And if we don't have that kind of capability to maintain the importance of, or to the, the focus on eradication and control of diseases that already exist, then I think we, uh, we put uh, trade at risk when, when we do that. But I think that's something that certainly can be dealt with in this uh, in new Department of Homeland Security. I'm gonna conclude uh, before I ask the general question. Uh, it, Mr. Bauman, um, I think it's very exciting uh, for FEMA to obviously play a major role in this effort. And when I look at the purple, which is where you are, correct? That's correct. Um, the, you have preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery. Preparedness uh, has the connotation to me, obviously, of preparing the federal government, preparing the state and local, the first responders. And um, it, it, uh, what the White House is suggesting is that we are going to draw on other agencies that have been involved in this effort and bring them under, the, the, uh, uh, under this title of preparedness. Could you speak a little to this and, and how there might be advantages by doing sure. this? Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the uh, President's 03 budget proposal, uh, the Office of Domestic Preparedness at Justice would have been folded over into my office at, at FEMA. We're, this proposal goes one step further, is it folds both organizations plus the preparedness piece of DHHS all into one office. I think that's a, a, a threefold force multiplier in that now we've got 300 people working on very related preparedness issues. So, you know, be they natural disaster, weapons of mass destruction related, uh, there, are, there has been a duplication of preparedness efforts among the three agencies. We've been working with those agencies to reduce that. This will now put us all in one office and, and I think, uh, make us better work together and more effectively. Um, 
Mr. Putnam, I'm going to invite you to ask your questions, and I'm just going to ask the last question. So if you have a question you want to ask or two, uh, feel free. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just ask one more. Uh, I, I know that the hour's late, and these outstanding men and their staffs have put an awful lot into this, and for, for many of them, it's as new to them as it is to us. So, you know, we're all trying to, to feel our way through this. Uh, wh what I have witnessed being in what I call a sentinel state in Florida that you know, sort of hangs out there and is exposed to a lot of issues, uh, illegal immigration, the drug, uh, the, the poorest borders, all of those issues, is that the well-funded, bright, capable terrorist who means us ill most likely can can find a way to bring some kind of harm or damage in some way, shape, or form to the American public. But our real weakness has been in the everyday stuff. I mean, we still have drugs coming in, despite a multi-decade war on drugs. We still have illegal immigration. We still have a trafficking of endangered species, and we still have uh, unintentional introductions of plant pests and diseases. And up until September the 11th, the, the basis for all of that has been, the, or the conventional wisdom was that there was a lack of coordination among the agencies, that Customs is there looking for a very specific thing. APHIS is there looking for a very specific different thing, and, and so forth and so on, and that Customs doesn't employ a whole lot of veterinarians that know the difference between an ordinary tick or a African heartwater tick, which would wipe out the livestock industry. If you're all under one roof, how, but, but you're still functioning as separate subgroups, how will we, on a daily basis, on the ground, in the trenches, in the ports, as all of this commerce is coming in and all of these cruise passengers are unloading, and we currently only inspect 1% of them and 25% of international air travelers, as all of these people are rushing by and we're trying to encourage freer and fairer and more open trade, and as the world shrinks and airfares are reduced and more and more people want to go fishing in Costa Rica instead of just coming to Florida, and we have all of this movement, how is that really going to improve on a daily basis by being under the same roof? What will be different in the way that Customs speaks to APHIS, who speaks to fish and wildlife, who speaks to the INS? How will all of those actually improve the percentage of cargo or people who are uh, interacted with? How will it improve or increase the number of drug shipments or weapon shipments that we interdict? How will it reduce the number of plants, pests, and diseases that are allowed to get in to the homeland that end up costing us millions of dollars to eradicate? Anyone? I'll take my best shot at it, Congressman. Actually, I think... Um, no, it's late, but I want you to speak nice and loud. Certainly. Please. I said we'll take our best shot at this. I think, indeed, one of the things we've talked about that, that comes out of this process is um, a, a sense of unified command and unified purpose. Um, you're talking about a, a number of agencies that have both a strong cultural and historical uh, foundation. And if this works right, and I think we have the potential to build something really important here, uh, you can merge together and bring all of those forces together. It ought to allow us to put more people on a problem. It ought to allow us to use those people better. You have situations right now where for our staffing purposes and INS staffing purposes at the same location, we have to staff at levels that if we were one unified body, we might not have to staff at. The ability to share information, the ability, we're, we are in the process right now of building a new automated system that a number of the agencies at this table are gonna be using called ACE. That's our new automated platform for the 21st century. That tool ought to really give us some of the, the, the critical information we need to make some of these decisions. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think a very talented, motivated terrorist will always find a way. But I think what this proposal does and what I think we're all committed to, and I certainly know the 21,000 men and women of the U.S. Customs Service are committed to, is making it as, 
as hard as possible for that to ever happen again. And I think this is a step forward. What we hope comes out of this is the ability for us all to communicate more rapidly, to have those mechanisms in place so that we can get the resources and assets we need to bring to bear on a problem quickly, rapidly, and in a, in a fashion where we aren't fumbling around to try to get there. And I think this process moves us a long way toward that. Mr. Acord, I think you've, you've heard well, this frustration come from me before. So, I, I think the, um, one of the things that it certainly will do is provide us greater access to containers uh, so that, that you know, we don't have uh, uh, you know, several different people looking at uh, you know, containers for different reasons. I think there's, a, there's an immediate improvement probably in the access to, uh, you know, to containers. The information system that uh, uh, you know, that Commissioner Browning talked about, I think we've got uh, uh, you know, a great deal of, of efficiency that we will achieve by having, by being part of that uh, uh, system. And I think we can, you know, perhaps deploy our uh, professional expertise, the trained, uh, you know, biologists, the veterinarians that, uh, you know, the entomologists, the pathologists that we have. Uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity perhaps to uh, utilize their, uh, you know, their skills a little more efficiently and, and have them focus on uh, you know, maybe th some of the higher risk uh, uh, pathways that are, that are available to, uh, for entry into the U.S. And on the other front, I, I, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that there's always the risk of something getting through the, uh, you know, the border. That's why we focused our attention on uh, uh, early detection, rapid response. That's why we're, uh, you know, have put out uh, more resources to the states to try to, uh, uh, to increase the number of people that's out, that are out there looking for plant and animal disease, and then to have emergency preparedness, uh, you know, plans in place uh, uh, that provides us the opportunity for a quick response to that. Because the earlier we find it, the quicker we can respond to it, control it, and eradicate it, then. The, the cheaper it is and the less uh, uh, for us and the less economic damage is done to, uh, to the agriculture community. Commissioner. I would agree with everything my colleagues have said, but I would add one thing. What this plan does for us is it gives us a clear chain of command. We're working for one outfit. And so, as Commissioner Browning had mentioned, you know, there are turf issues. There are, you know, uh, issues out there that in the past have uh, probably caused conflict. <clears throat> but a sheer clean chain of command, a clear chain of command, is going to change that. It's going to ensure that we understand that our focus is on the mission, and it's all of our focus. How this looks five, ten years down the line, um, whether or not people walk around with uh, Border Patrol or INS or U.S. Customs Service patches on them, that will be resolved over great debate, and I'm sure it will be resolved, uh, you know, much of that debate right here. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's got to change. And the President has said it. I think you see from us, I know you keep looking for the realistic answer and, and you know, what are the real problems with this? I think we could all anticipate that there will be problems. But I think you also see from the responses here today that we're all leaning forward in the saddle to make this work. We want to make it work. It's important to America. It's certainly important to my agency to move on with life and, and to make it the best agency it can be in support of this nation. I don't mean to take anything from anyone else here, but I, I just think this is the smart thing to do, and we need to get on with it. I would like to ask uh, any of you if there was a question you had prepared to answer um, and wish we had ans asked you that you'd like to ask yourself and answer the question. Is there anything you want to put on record? And I will make the point to you that the doctor I referred to who talked about alerting our committee to what an individual scientist could do, not a country, but a group of scientists, in altering a biological agent and wiping out humanity, that was basically he asked the question, he responded to it. Is there any question that we need to put on the record, any statement you need to put on the record before we adjourn this hearing? 
Let me say to uh, each of you that we started uh, this morning with six members of Congress, two senators, four members of Congress. It's the first time in my memory that we treated the members of Congress as witnesses. Uh, it wasn't perfunctory. They came. They spoke for a number of hours on something they've worked on for years. Uh, we had um, Warren Rudman, who basically was one of the three major commissions uh, empowered to have us look at this issue for years. Uh, and for years, they have suggested we have a Department of Homeland Security. And I was very curious to see what this panel would be, this third panel that we began at 1 o'clock. Um, you have, in my judgment, given credit to your agency, given credit to the administration, given credit to us by your thoroughness and your responses. Um, and I feel, uh, quite frankly, very impressed by how you've been able to put this all together in such short notice. Appreciate what your staffs have done to cooperate with us. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to this panel. It's been an outstanding panel. And I also appreciate your patience, because it's a big panel. Thank you very much. This hearing is adjourned. on C-SPAN. Remarks from President Bush and congressional leaders after their White House meeting on Homeland Security. After that, Pakistan's ambassador to the U.S. talks about relations between the U.S. and her country. Later, Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz dedicates a memorial to those killed at the Pentagon on September 11th. Later this morning on Washington Journal, a look at federal estate